गुड इवनिंग दनीला सर गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर मंजू जी डॉक्टर मनी लॉन्ग टाइम गुड इवनिंग हाउ आर यू फीलिंग आई एम फाइन थैंक यू वेलकम एंड वेरी गुड इवनिंग इट इज माय प्रिविलेज एज द सेक्रेटरी ऑफ कोलकाता सोसाइटी फॉर एशियन स्टडीज एंड द कॉन्वेनर ऑफ दिस वेबिनार वेबिनार टू वेलकम यू ऑल the distinguished resource persons and the learned audiences um, to celebrate a century of the discovery of indus valley civilization today we are assembled here online on the platform of kolkata society for asian studies for a very important discussion based on our four uh, four talks from four distinguished archaeologists uh, of our country we have with us dr b r mani former director general national museum and vice chancellor nmi dr sanjay kumar manjul joint director archaeological survey of india professor vasant sinde former vice chancellor deccan college and renowned archaeologist and museologist and dr michael and janino visiting professor humanities and social sciences iit gandhinagar we have with us the advisor of this particular program professor pallav sen gupto as the guest of honor he is our mentor and one of the advisory board members of kolkata society for asian studies professor shengupto is the former vidyasagar professor of rabindra bharati university department of bengali and he is former president the asiatic society kolkata we shall start our today's lecture program with the introductory remarks of dr shotobroto chakraborty president kolkata society for asian studies dr chakraborty is the general secretary of the asiatic society kolkata he is the former deputy director of anthropological survey of india today the meeting will be presided over by professor emeritus ranjuna re she is one of the vice presidents of kolkata society for asian studies and the chief editor of our journal journal of kolkata society for asian studies she is one of the coordinators of this program professor re is the former head and faculty of the department of anthropology university of calcutta as dr shotobroto chakraborty president of ksas is unable uh, today to preside over this program we have requested professor ray to preside 
the program and she has agreed at the end of this program we can experience the concluding remarks and vote of thanks from dr durga basu she is also one of the coordinators of this program dr basu is also one of the vice presidents of kolkata society for asian studies she is former head and professor of department of archaeology university of calcutta now i am requesting dr chakraborty to begin this program with his introductory address thank you sir mr welcome sir good afternoon to everybody at the very outset let me apologize for being unable to sit through the session today because of certain personal inconvenience but nevertheless i did not want to skip this chance of welcoming of the very distinguished panel of speakers including professor pollav shengupta who is at the back of this very important historical program the antiquity of the civilization where four distinguished speakers are participating from various angles they would talk on the subject and professor shengupta of course will comment and in addition to that i am thankful to professor ranjana rai who has readily agreed to shoulder the responsibility which was originally on my shoulder and also our other attendants participants online including one of the vice presidents professor durga basu who will also talk at the end i really do not want to snatch away of your valuable time from the already scheduled program i just wanted to say hello to everybody and thank you very very much on behalf of the kolkata society for asian studies thank you professor ray if you take the charge of this program now to chair the program okay so uh, welcome to everyone and uh, to all the those who are going to listen to the program as well as of course the very erudite and who had worked first hand with the uh, uh, in as for the civilization i should say and um, of course to others who have come to listen to the program but uh, i have uh, uh, the name of uh, this webinar is uh, celebrating 100 years of discovery of indus valley civilization someone uh, had really objected to 100 years to the word 100 years saying that actually it should be 102 years but when i dug into the uh, discovery history of the discovery then i find that actually the excavation uh, had started in 1922 so we have just completed a century and we have uh, stepped into the second century of the discovery uh, so anyway uh, what uh, i would like to say as uh, my introductory speech that shomisha has uh, asked me to do is that uh, actually uh, if we calculate that way it goes back to 1826 when charles mason reported about the harappan site all of us know about it maybe some of those who are not exactly into the line uh, they that don't know that charles mason reported about the uh, harappa mound which had appeared to him of quite importance and uh, it was at that time the many people believed that there must have been an old town beneath this mound at harappa however 
uh, we know that uh, in 1921, uh, Dharam Shahani had uh, spoken about it and he said that this must uh, be going back to Mauryan dynasty, even before Mauryan dynasty. And then uh, we know after that, uh, when he had guessed about the antiquity of Harappa in 1922, Rakhal Dash had dug a trench in, uh, trench, uh, in Mahanjadara Stupa and uh, he found the materials were very similar to Harappa. So afterwards, John Marshall, Sir John Marshall took up the uh, excavation and he had done the excavation up to 1931. And uh, this was uh, actually, uh, in, as all of us know, that 1947 onwards, these uh, sites were on the other side of the newly formed nation, that's Pakistan. And uh, But however, the uh, excavation was taken up by uh, Mortimer Miller after that. And um, then uh, actually the excavation had begun in Mohanjadaro as all of us know. And uh, then in uh, we, uh, Mortimer Wheeler had uh, uh, written the book after completion of uh, his work. He had written the book in 1953, that is the Indus Valley Civilization. Actually, this was a part of the Cambridge uh, history of India. And uh, the term Indus Valley Civilization actually was coined by him because he found that there were a lot more uh, sites. Uh, so it shouldn't be called a Sarappan Civilization or Mohanjadaro Civilization only. And he gave the term uh, as uh, that. After that, uh, there were, there had been, uh, in fact, by the time uh, he, Miller has done his, uh, with his work and he has written the uh, book, there were many more sites found. But most of the sites were uh, mainly, more, mainly around the Indus. And uh, if, you, if you look at the book, um, uh, at the map, in his book, we find that there are only uh, a few uh, sites that had been found along the Hakra. Otherwise, most of his, uh, the sites that we get in his book, which was published in 1953, most of them are around the Indus system. And uh, then uh, we had uh, mainly uh, there were <coughs> um, um, uh, since the discovery of Harappa and Mohanjadaro, hundreds other sites were discovered. As of today, as of today, hundreds and more than that, uh, thousands of uh, sites were discovered. And the major sites that are having the big city structure, that may be mentioned. There are many that I am going to mention here. Ganveri uh, Wala, Rakhi Gadi, Thulavira, Lothal. I was fortunate because of Dr. Mahil that we had gone to Thulavira with Vidula Jaishal and myself. But that was something amazing that I could see of uh, the excavation we, we, we stayed uh, next to, uh, to the mound excavation site at the guest house of archaeological Sur survey of india the museum the excavation is something unbelievable especially that northern gate uh, signboard that has been there so archaeological survey continued with their work in exploration and excavation and there were many more sites, even in Punjab area, that are found. We had recently heard from uh, Bonani Bhattacharya about her Sunal excavation. So, uh, a lot of work has been going on. So, Bonani is here, if I find her. <laughs> so, they had all done uh, so much of work and still are doing uh, a lot. And uh, Dr. Mani has done uh, also a, a work in Gongaman so that from that work we get some glimpse of uh, the west or, uh, eastward migration uh, that had happened after the decline and that's wonderful uh, work that they, he has taken up with uh, Benares uh, in the Benares area 
So uh, there were more than 300,000 square miles covering. That is what we also had read in our book, uh, in our textbook from the Himalayas, starting from the Himalayas to the Godavari River in the south, from Indus Valley uh, in the west to the plains of Ganga, Jamuna rivers uh, in the east. And north, it is, there had been some a few sites uh, which were found from Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. These are what I have got from the recent um, publication. So it is uh, also established. The development had also been established because earlier there were so much of Eurocentric views about the uh, beginning of uh, the uh, Indus Valley civilization because Sumerian was discovered earlier than that. So the, those have been settled uh, and uh, it has been found that mainly the farming communities who were living along the Baluch hills, they had contributed mainly to the development of Indus Valley civilization. Uh, and, um, but of course, we cannot deny that there had been in and out of migration uh, of uh, people, maybe especially in the form of uh, uh, the, the shifting agriculturists as well as the hunter ga gatherers. So, the problem that uh, stood out after all these years, and still looking today, first is about the alien migration theory. I think there has been a lot of work down in for the last 30 years, which has uh, actually had uh, nullified the uh, alien invasion theory. And what we have uh, uh, found out in Miller's own words, Miller has uh, said that since there was no more, no other evidence, so I have to uh, give some kind of theory of why the uh, civilization has declined. And there are experts um, uh, there who are also going to ex uh, explain how far it is uh, true or how far it is not true or what, what the current uh, situation is. So uh, uh, another uh, um, the problem that also is there is about the scripts. Uh, Isa Dash had tried uh, about that. And there are so many people, Kalpoga and so many people who are trying to decipher but no one agrees to one point and not totally that uh, scripts were deciphered and that's a big problem i think we could, uh, could have known a lot more about indus valley civilization if uh, that we have known about so um, there are also work being done, as uh, all of you know, by, by the bioarchaeologists who, who are mainly the students of Kennedy, Dr. Professor Kennedy, especially could be mentioned about some work had been done by Lukács and some mainly with the Robin Shub, who came uh, as, uh, as a fellow to uh, the Anthropological Survey of India and had done started work and she still is going on with her work on bioarchaeology, about the health, about the disease system, etc., of the, uh, and the trauma of the Indus Valley skeleton. But of course, those are very uh, little uh, amount uh, of skeletal remains are there, considering the population that might have been there. So, the uh, not only archaeologists, I shouldn't be saying that archaeologists, of course, they are doing their grinding and their head into the problem, but there are also other branches of science which has contributed to the knowledge of Indus Valley civilization and about its maker and about the aftermath of Indus Valley civilization. Like I have just uh, mentioned about the bioarchaeologists and uh, the uh, there, there, there are also, as uh, Dr. Mani has uh, carried out uh, his research uh, that I know about Ganga uh, Valley, that that was a multidisciplinary approach that he had taken. He himself was there. There were also geologists, geographers, and that's wonderful work, of course. And this uh, kind of multidisciplinary work is uh, giving us a lot 
more clearer view of the uh, work or of the situation that existed uh, uh, in, in the Saraswati system. So, Professor, we have here the we have our of course our guest of honors, Professor uh, Pallu Chandrupto, and uh, for speakers we have Professor Washington Shinde, uh, who has been working for a long time on archaeology and he has been working, uh, he basically was located in uh, Deccan College. Then Dr. B. R. Mani, he has done so much and uh, I'm really uh, grateful to him for giving so many knowledge to me, helping me in so many ways with Ankar and other things. And of course, Dr. Sanjay Manju, who I find is very young and very enthusiastic, and uh, I, I'm sure he's also very hardworking. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure we are going to listen to him and get many ideas what is happening exactly at the present moment that we don't know. We look into Miller's book, we look into Danino's book, and uh, so we are we waiting eagerly to listen to you. And, uh, and then uh, Michel Danino, Dr. Michel Danino, I'm really a fan of his because I have listened to him uh, for the first time at a place uh, where he had given a lecture on the Lord's River Saraswati. And I, after that, immediately I went and purchased the book. And I, I have, uh, I also happened to be connected with Ramakrishna Mission. So one of the Maharajas gave me the book for the school children, the inversion that never was. Very simply written for the school children. I, I am also fascinated with the book. So there are uh, so many stalwarts we have. And I'm really grateful to uh, all of all four of you for agreeing to be here. Uh, even though you are, I know, very busy, uh, because I called um, uh, Michelle this uh, afternoon and he, and he was taking class. So we had to converse on WhatsApp. And I had, uh, so I'm very happy and I'm very grateful to you for uh, joining uh, into the webinar. And uh, we hope to publish the lectures so that greater public will go to know because people have so much of uh, information ab about in the study. And I know all of you know, especially the Indian, but that even nowadays, uh, there are so many old things that are about in the studies, the civilization that are taught in our school levels. I don't know, it has to be, all of you have to take initiative to give at least our children some idea about the great civilization that grew up in our uh, soil and it's uh, without any Eurocentric bias. I think to be proud that we were the architects of such uh, a great civilization. So I hope that this will be done at the present moment. So I will now request uh, uh, to, for the speech of our guest of honor and I, I'm sure um, um, Professor Pallav Chengupto, uh, Shormisha, are you going to introduce him, uh, him again? Shormisha. No, no, no need to uh, introduce. I have already introduced have him. enough introduction yes. to him. So, Professor Pallav Chengupto, kindly please. Thank you, Professor Zai. <coughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Shottabhati Shottabhati, Professor Ranjana Jai, and all our distinguished scholars. At the very onset, I would like to congratulate the organizers of this virtual conclave for undertaking an overdue task. That is, rethinking about Indus Valley civilization on the occasion of completion of one century after its discovery from the abyss of Olivia. <clears throat> I'm not sure, but presume that this end of of Calcutta Society for Asian Studies perhaps is the first 
that an organization is celebrating this significant event. Though full one century has elapsed after the re-emergence of the sites of this lost civilization of the pan-Indian subcontinent, a number of questions still remain unresolved. It is true that the most vital among them is the non-decipherment of scripts engraved on the hundreds of seals found from several sites of this lost civilization. Archaeologists and scriptologists all over the world had been trying to read the mysteries, mysterious signs of the seals, but still did a total success has not been evolved. Some of the pertinent questions should also be noted in this collection. I humbly admit that I am neither an archaeologist nor a student of scriptology, but as a student of prehistory and protohistory, I feel there are a number of unresolved problems concerning Indus Valley civilization. First, who were the Indus Valley people? What was their ethnic identity? Contemporary excavations have proved that there had been some 70 plus sites distributed in several places of India and Pakistan, covering thousands of square kilometers. Has the sing one single ethnic group of the people could not have lived there, but what were the languages? As the symbols of the scriptures of the scripts were same or similar, really a complex problem arises here. Secondly, some scholars such as Ascoperpola and a few others have indicated the language of the Mahindadaro Harappa scripts may have a faint affinity with the Dravidian family of languages. It may be recalled that an almost obsolete language, Brahui, was spoken in small pockets of Balochistan even in the 20th century, and it belonged to the Dravidian group of languages. H. Tania Pakistan, famous archaeologist, had also suggested the same. This contention needs further evidence. Third point to be explored is whether the Tilmun Akadilmun, the prosperous business city in the east on ancient days, had any connection with the port city of Indus State Lothal. The documents of the first millennium of the pre-Christian era in the that were found in different centers in the Persian Gulf area had many a times suggested that there had been a trade connection between Middle East region and the flourishing port city in the East. May, maybe it is what we now call Lothal. And the connection of the Soviet and Assyria with the Indus people is all we know, but it is very unique. Another virtual co vital question, according to Buddha Prakash and some others, reflections of the battles and the consequences between the Rig Vedic people and Aryans between the Rig Vedic people, Rig Vedic Aryans and the certain dark skinned black nosed people of some unnamed city state were found in the several homes of Rig Veda. According to Rig Veda, they used it used to worship these ideas and phallic symbols. Muro Deva, Shishnu Deva, as it has been mentioned in the Rigved. In a battle by the side of River Jajaboti, that is Irabhoti, Ravi, a city named Harijupia, obviously is Harappa, was attacked by the Vedic people and it was devastated. All such suggestions should be re-verified, of course. 
John Marshall about him was one of the right now such so me had identified certain indices that might conform with the idea of proto shiva and our esteemed professor Heinz Moody had come to conclusion that some permutations and combinations with the certain seals would suggest that the earliest form of Mohisha Mordini, that is Goddess Durga, was worshipped there. These and many other questions are yet to be finally resolved. I hope the eminent scholars present in this colloquium may advise some points to solve these and other century old problems. I'm grateful to the organizers for giving me a chance. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Paul Chandra, for uh, giving a uh, report for you on your different findings mm -hmm. and also specifically on linguistics and other issues. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm sure we shall know more from the on this point on from the uh, other speakers who are present. Now I would invite uh, Dr. B. R. Mani. Uh, uh, whose title of the uh, lecture is 100 Years of Mahatmadaro, Threshold of Indian Civilization. And uh, our secretary, Dr. Solmeshtar uh, Dev Roshi, is going to introduce him. Dr. B. L. Bani, uh, former Director General, National Museum, and Vice Chancellor, NMI, has been a renowned field archaeologist, uh, numismatist, and art, art critic, who has earlier served as additional Director General in the Archaeological Survey of India till April 2015. He has a um, throughout first plus first career up to his master degree, which he did from Benares Hindu University in 1976, receiving Altekar Gold Medal and BHU Gold Medal, and completed his PhD on life in the Kushan age in 1980 from BHU. He has been teaching in BHU and Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies from 1978 till 1984, when he joined the ASI as Deputy Superintending Archaeologist. Archaeologist. Since then, he has been involved in conservation of nearly 150 centrally protected monuments in Maharashtra, Goa, Uh, Delhi and Jammu and Kashmir. Due to his effort, uh, efforts, some monuments got inscribed in the World Heritage List of the UNESCO. He has discovered a large number of archaeological sites, antiquities, and inscriptions in the places he worked in the various states, besides, besides also in Uttar Pradesh and Haryana during his ex explorations. He has directed 20 excavation projects in the country, some of which uh, are uh, Lalkot, Delhi, Salibagar, Delhi, Muhammad Nagar, Haranol, and Bohor Manjra, Haryana, Sismania, Sankisa, Ayodhya, Lathaya, UP, and Kanshipur, Jafarchak, and Ambaran, Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir. His excavations at Ayodhya in 2003 provided evidence to settle the over 100 years old title suit in the Allahabad High Court, Lucknow Bench. Uh, in 2010, 
and later in Supreme Court, India in 2019. An important outcome of this excavation was the establishment of the date of Northern Black Polished Ware culture. Going back to the end of second millennium BCE, which has been confirmed in at least 10 excavations afterwards, he re-excavated the sites of Kapilavastu, Raja, Rajghat, and Sharnath UP during 2013 to 15, primarily to fix the chronological horizon of these significant sites. He has also excavated a pre and early Harappan site, Kunal, in Haryana from 2016 to 2019. Dr. Mani is member of various national and international organizations in the field and has widely traveled to European, American, and Asian countries in international seminars and conferences. He has seven books, seven edited books, and about 200 research papers in, and articles uh, to his credit. Presently, uh, he is the treasurer of the Indian Archaeological Society, New Delhi, and member of the high-level committees of Ministry of Culture, such as Central Advisory Board of Culture, Central Advisory Board of Archaeology, National Screening and Evolution Committee, etc. The Indian Council of Historical Research has offered him the National Fellowship in 2021. Now I invite Dr. Mani to uh, deliver his lecture. Good evening, distinguished scholars. And thank you, Sir Mishaji, and also Professor Rajana Ray. Uh, I'm grateful to the Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for inviting me to deliver the first lecture in this series. And I have purposely given the title Threshold of Indian Civilization. Hundred years ago, we all know, and it has been uh, repeated by scholars, how Mohenjo-daro was excavated. And a little uh, before that, Harappa was discovered, and that, that was also excavated. So, excavations which took place in the early 1920s, they brought a paradigm shift in the study of Indian uh, history and Indian civilization. Till 1920, the history of uh, India was considered to be about 2,500 years old history, beginning uh, around 600 BC with uh, Buddha and followed by Mauryans. But the discovery at uh, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro changed the entire scenario. And Indian civilization was put up in the same way as the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia or Egypt used to be there. There were river valley civilizations, and that is how. Uh, some people called this as Indus civilization. 
however uh, later on i'll i think uh, um, dr uh, michel denino will agree with me because uh, he has written about the uh, great book uh, the lost river saraswati and i was present at the time of its release in iic in new delhi and in that book he has very clearly said that uh, uh, most of the sites at least four times the indus valley related sites or the harappan sites are located on the bank of a uh, dried river bed of saraswati then those at indus researches have taken place both in india and pakistan and it was around the period when uh, the partition took place of the country most of the sites which were explored uh, in baluchistan and punjab region punjab sind region they went to the other side uh, of the border and just a few sites remained so focus was given initially by the archaeological survey of india with which other universities and learned institutions also joined later and then new discoveries were made sites were explored and excavated and now uh, what uh professor michel denino has uh, given the list the number of the sites on dry river bed of saraswati as well as those which are in the uh, river bed of indus so uh, four times more and that has led to some scholars call uh, it as saraswati civilization some scholars call it indus saraswati civilization whatever the case may be but i consider this to be the indian civilization and that is why uh, m- the, uh, i have given this title threshold of indian civilization when we start 1921 22 and start looking into the uh, harappan studies it's like opening a pandora's box and uh, one by one new pages are open we very well know the saptasindhu area which is mentioned in the vedic literature also mentioning aryavarta and uh, if we uh, say if we think the area of uh, civilization which the spread of uh, the sites of harappan early harappan pre harappan related sites they are mostly in the area which is the area of saptasindhu pradesh then the radiometric dates and other uh literary traditional and other uh evidences they also prove this after this discovery of harappa and mohenjodaro many of the legends which were uh, spread about indian civilization were shattered and we can very well think of the 
cradle of civil, civil, Indian civilization, which was there around the dried river bed of Saraswati on both the uh, sides of Saraswati. And the recent studies have suggested that there are a number of sites which are datable to around 7000 BCE. There are sites in Baluchistan also, which uh, like Mehargarh and some others, which are quite similarly uh, dated. There are sites in this part of the country where Virana, Kunal, Rathigadi, uh, Kalibanga, um, Viravad, Binjor, and others have been explored. So that gives some idea about what was happening around 7000 BC. When we move towards east, we find that there are sites explored and excavated in the past 20 years or so, like Lavradeva, Josi, uh, Ayodhya, Agyabir, Narhan, Imlidi, and many others in the Ganga, middle, middle Ganga Valley as well as in the Vindyas. And the earliest dates from them, they are also around 7000 BC. So definitely something was happening at that time. Same conclusion has also been reached by those scholars and scientists who are working on astronomical observation of the movement of uh, movement and configuration of stars and planets so uh, they also suggest similar type of dates based on their study of the planets planetary system which is found in the later Vedic literature or Mahabharata or Ramayana and they have also given their opinion. So uh, it also seems possible that uh, the earliest civilization which was existing particularly in the region of, uh, you can say, Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Gujarat, in this part of the country, they were much earlier established than the third, third millennium BC. And we know that the earliest uh, literature in Sanskrit is Rigved, which is probably the earliest literature of the world. And that also suggests the area to be the same, which is covered by the Harpan civilization. We know the shorter chronology which many of the scholars of the 19th and 20th century, early 20th century, they were following. And they were probably following it because of the James Usher who had published his work 
1600 pages based on some biblical uh, derivatives where he says uh, uh, and followed by other missionaries or missionary historians that the world was created 4004 BCE. So how anything can be before 4000 BCE? So everything the historians and archaeologists started putting after 4004 BCE. And we find that the same thing continued but with the scientific efforts, with the uh, scientific datings, those things were refuted. And now we are very sure that uh, the civilization in this part came much earlier. Now, I would like to mention one more thing. That is, the uh, somebody has earlier mentioned about the Sumerian contacts, or um, I think Professor Piplo um, uh, had mentioned that the contacts with Dilmun and others. So there were three parts, uh, as per the Sumerian literature, three uh, important regions. Magan, Dilmun, and uh, Meluha. Meluha is uh, normally considered to be the Harpan area. Similarly, Magan is around, um, um, it's all Magan and Dilmun, Bahrain and uh, the area in the Arabic world. And there were contacts. That is also very clear. We have evidences about 10,000 uh, clay tablets had been found in uh, Sumeria. And uh, in, in, no, sorry. They were found at Bogazkoi in Turkey, where apart from them, there were inscriptions in which the Indian deities in the Mitra were invoked, and also Ashwini Kumar they are mentioned. And they are mentioned in the 14th century BCE. On the other hand, it was proposed by uh, Max Muller and others that uh, there was an Aryan invasion. The people came from West Asia or Central Asia, attacked India, settled here, and such type of stories were most probably intentionally uh, created. And they have no uh, logical basis, we can say. I'm not going into details of uh, different uh, archaeological sites which are relevant to around 7000 BCE. But I must tell that even Kalibanga, which is uh, which has the phase of early Hadapans, has also a date of 5600 to 5224 uh, BCE, which was usually ignored as a solitary date. But 
I had discussed it with Professor Lal, and he agreed that uh, in the context of present uh, um, day calculations of uh, early historic uh, early uh, datings of Harappan uh, sites, this could be not just a, a fake date, but this must be uh, a date which one can follow. So I was just mentioning about uh, the Sumerian uh, or Babylonian contacts and also the contact with uh, uh, Turkey where those tablets and inscriptions, uniform inscriptions have been found. In this context, I'm, I would also like to uh, mention that uh, there were different classes of society which were living in uh, the contemporary uh, culture. There were classical people who were uh, following Sanskrit, having great uh, knowledge, who were also meditating and uh, collecting great knowledge. And simultaneously, in the same uh, period, there were people who were living in the uh, state of uh, Stone Age. In Rigved itself, in the ninth mandal, 12th Sukt, uh, second uh, mantra, it is uh, related. Jarati Hiroshadhi Bhi Parne Bhi Shakuna Nam Karmaro Ashmabhir Gur Bhir Hiranyanta Michatindro Parishrava. That means the craftsman Karmar used to make arrows with the help of old and sharp stone pieces and then they were also putting the parnevi uh, shakunanam the um, wings of the feathers feathers of birds so such people were also there who were uh, like uh, hunters and gatherers and simultaneously there were those people also who were following the great uh, scientific uh, knowledge. Apart from Bogaskoi, we, uh, when we uh, see that uh, uh, the Meluha, which is mentioned in uh, Sumerian literature, there also uh, there are texts of horse training manual where uh, the words, Sanskrit words like Vartan are mentioned. Vartan is a circle and horses are trained in circles. They are tied with rope and uh, initially they are trained in uh, with uh, taking rounds of uh, the circle. And there the numbers of uh, Vartan are mentioned. Aik, Ter, uh, Panj, Saat, like that. And Vartan, word Vartan is same used there. There are words giving the colors of the horse. Who says horse was not available then? 
the colors of the horse babru and uh, uh, pingal or parit that is palit gray and then there are uh, inscriptions and tablets which are kept mostly in the british museum as well as in the uh, louvre uh, museum which vividly describe the uh, a, the granary of the uh, meluha village in sumer which uh, describe that the meluhans were trading in gold dust carnelian and uh, 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 lapis lazuli and their ships were coming from meluha and uh, they they were coming also along with their interpreters and the typical the particular uh, mention of a meluhan interpreter is not just mentioned in the, in a tablet but he is also depicted translating the meluhan language to the uh, sumerians and then recently some uh, musicologist has done wonderful work on the uh, words of uh, which are connected with music and no less than 60 such words have been traced in sumerian language and Uh, i i must mention uh, just like in sanskrit there is mrij which is uh, mentioned as mars in uh, sumerian sanskrit word damaru uh, is uh, mentioned in sumerian as demarshu sanskrit word for not just uh, music Uh, related or instruments related things but also uh, related to different types of wood they are also there and then lastly i must also mention that the there was not just the uh, traffic from west to east but also from east to west in bodhayan shrout sutra we have references of about second millennium bce where it is mentioned that uh, the two sons of uh, ail pururvas they were sent on two uh, directions east ayu went to east amavasu went to west and uh, first amavasu went to gandhar then uh, he went to parshu that is persia or uh, faras iran and after parshu he went to arat that is ararat in iran so uh, the contacts between india and west asia they were very strong and there was the cultural undercurrent between the two regions so there are so many things to mention but i think my time is over so uh, i'll just close with these words thank you very much thank you very much that was really some new uh, information that we got and uh, i'm sure many of the people would be uh, ask you any clarification or something but i have uh, not said that it will be better to keep them either in the chat box or uh, for the end of the lectures uh, so thank you very much it was really 
very interesting. And, uh, and full of new insights. Professor Roy, kindly unmute your not able to hear you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear now? Okay, sorry, sorry, I was talking without uh, unmuting. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you again. I thank uh, I my work. Thank you, Dr. Dear Marie. It was really great to have uh, your talk, especially with so much of inputs of new information about uh, inner Swami civilization. Thank you very much. I know many people would like to ask a lot of questions and so that we can discuss in the end of the four lectures or um, they may stay and ask the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our second speaker is Dr. Sanjay Kumar Manjul, who is of course here. And, uh, uh, his title of lecture is New Excavation of Harappan Sites on the Bank of River Saraswati. And uh, I would ask uh, our secretary, Dr. Debasu, to introduce him. Thank you. Sharmishta. Well, uh, I think uh, a little bit had been uh, said about him in the beginning, and maybe somehow she can't listen, uh, hear me or what, but uh, uh, he has got all the, uh, disc uh, all about your, um, yeah, show me, show me, please. Please now, please introduce uh, Dr. Sanjay Manji. Please unmute. You are like me, I am unmuted. Can't hear you, ma'am. Please unmute your phone. Mr. we cannot hear you. Something is wrong. It may be better to, if she leaves the meeting, you don't have to get Yes, I think at the end we will often this uh, have way. that. And I would now rather be. If I have any problem, I can speak, and after that, <laughs> it will be. Please you go ahead. I think she has got some problem with the microphone. So please start your lecture, which okay. I have said that it's new excavation of Harappan sites on the bank of River Shaushi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, uh, before the August gathering. Uh, Mr. Benino is here. Uh, Dr. B.R. Mani and uh, Professor Ray uh, and uh, a lot of galaxy of the scholars uh, are present here. Uh, uh, Dr. Mani has set an uh, entire background uh, for uh, how to speak about the Harper civilization. They have set the all platform, the history and background the context, uh, uh, sea context, uh, uh, the settlement pattern, date, and also uh, about the Vedic uh, context, etc. So obviously, uh, there is a lot to speak uh, on uh, the Harappan civilization, uh, particularly development, the new uh, thoughts, new discovery, new thinking, 
the linking uh, with the other uh, contemporary culture, calculative culture, etc., etc. So, uh, but I'm not going in the detail uh, which has already been uh, told earlier. Uh, so, I'd like to uh, share my screen uh, for visual presentation also, uh, if you allow uh, me to uh, have my screen. And, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, please allow to share my screen because it's not visible. If you allow to share, then yes, please, please. You have uh, your PowerPoint. Ah, yes. I yes. have my PowerPoint also. Yes. Uh, please allow to. Uh, please. Because that will not allow that. Please, go ahead. You would have to see the PowerPoints. Actually, uh, I, I think uh, I don't have the control to. Uh, Share my PowerPoint. Show me, sir. Come on, come on, come on, The background is uh, already set. So, uh, after a long discoveries uh, of the bank of uh, rivers like Sapsar, uh, Sindhu, or Saraswati, Sindhu, and also uh, the Gujarat coast, and uh, the relation between uh, the river system and uh, the, uh, the sea, uh, the coastal area. So there is a lot of sites uh, already discovered among uh, the, even in the Saraswati civilization and the context with the uh, coastal region like uh, Dhalavira, Lothar, Puntasi, Baksara, a lot of sites have already been uh, explored and excavated. So for understanding of the river system and contact with the uh, coastal uh, sites and their contact is uh, very, very important for understanding of development of uh, sites. Uh, Dr. Manjul? Yes. Up, up, you can send the PowerPoint to Tamagno. He will share. He has given the, the, you to allow. He has allowed you, but still, I think there is some problem, technical problem. So okay, you I'm, can you can send the PowerPoint presentation to Tamagno. Okay, I'll, I'll try. You can mail us. Uh, uh, mail us. Mail us. Can mail us. Can share.
हेलो हेलो यस यस हाँ आर यू ही एंड स्क्रीन इज विजिबल यस 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 हाँ सो नाउ आई विल स्टार्ट या हाँ ओके आई हैव गिवन द टाइटल ऑफ माय प्रेजेंटेशन प्रेजेंटेशन इज रिसेंट एक्सक्वेशन ऑन ड्राइड बेड ऑफ सरस्वती दिश्वतोती रिवर बेसिकली सो एट प्रेजेंट आई एम डूइंग एक्सक्वेशन एट राखी गड़ी लास्ट टू इयर्स एंड आल्सो आई हैव एक्सक्वेटेड इम्पोर्टेंट साइट ऑफ बिंजौर दैट इज ऑन द बॉर्डर ऑफ पाकिस्तान इन अनुपगर तहसील सो टू साइट इन बिटवीन दैट साइट इन एंटायर घग्गर रिवर आई ट्राई टू एक्सप्लोर फॉर टू अंडरस्टैंड द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द हरपन कल्चर एज वेल एज द मेनी मेनी एलिमेंट्स विच हैज नॉट बीन डिस्कस्ड अर्लियर और मेयरली लिटिल बिट डिस्कस्ड अर्लियर so the finding of uh, in the saraswati uh, rakhi gadi is it's a really uh, amazing uh, and also uh, the binjor uh, site which we have excavated uh, right from 2013 to uh, three seasons uh, regularly and after that uh, we uh, started excavation at uh, the famous site sinoli in upper ganga yamuna doab uh and the one of the site of barnaba which is mentioned in mahabharat as a varnavat uh during that uh, i try to understand uh, the upper ganga yamuna doab and the relation with uh, diswatwati saraswati uh, river with upper ganga yamuna doab and overlapping of culture sometimes contact of the culture uh which has merely very less discussed earlier for holistic understanding of uh, uh, harappan civilization as mentioned earlier by dr b r mani the contemporary site like uh, lahora deva jhusi narhan imlidi etc in mid ganga valley uh, and uh, so we have to understand uh, the river system and their contact uh with the each other particularly harappan and contemporary chalcolithic uh sites uh so it's a really a very very long uh, uh questions and debate uh how to understand whether it's a linear development of harappan civilization or it had uh contact between the harappan civilization or uh, overlapping with the or the uh, sites like hulas uh, it's a very very important that's upper ganga yamuna doab uh, which has uh, been excavated by uh, dr k n dikshit uh, and report has already been published hulas has very very crucial evidence for understanding of harappan as well as uh, the chalcolithic culture in that region Uh, because some uh, only one uh, ceiling have been found there, no brick size, uh, no uh, uh, standardization or standard weight, uh, uh, which is marker of Harappan civilization, uh, uh, no big uh, typical other uh, markers of Harappan civilization, except few pottery's having uh, Harappan style of painting. Uh, uh and some of the uh, beads etc that is uh, related with the harappan civilization uh but the brick size is entirely different that is not uh, and if you see the dates dates is contemporary to the Har mature harappan phase as well as the late harappan phase of uh, harappan civilization so that is very very crucial point for understanding of uh, the relation between upper ganga yamuna doab with dishwatpati uh, saraswati civilization so at present uh, i am doing excavation at rakhi gadi and uh, we found some evidence for uh, uh, chalcolithic culture there itself uh, for better understanding particularly dishwatpati 
if you see the map, Vishwapati is very close to Yamuna. So that is uh, uh, very, very crucial for understanding of relation between Upper Ganga Yamuna Dwarf uh, with the Drisvatvati and, uh, 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 and after that, the Drisvatvati uh, meets together with Ghagar, that's a uh, Saraswati river. So there is a lot of work has already been done there for understanding of uh, uh, Saraswati bed and uh, over there, the plotting of the site and also uh, uh, the excavation uh, done in Harappan civilization more than uh, uh, now around 500 sites has already been excavated. Uh, uh, so we know uh, many things or many things uh, uh, of Harappan civilization, but yes, there is a lot of gray area also for understanding of the culture like uh, decipherment of script which has uh, not deciphered yet uh, and also uh, understanding uh, we have a little understanding of settlement pattern like uh, dhalavira we have uh, a beautiful settlement pattern even in kalibanga we know the segment of a uh, city plan uh, in banavali we also know uh, the settlement pattern of uh, radial uh, a pattern of uh, street and in the fortification horseshoe fortification uh, but still we don't know uh, how uh, they are using uh, for the animal hus husbandry how they are using uh, other uh, things because the settlement within the fortification there is no proper space for animal husbandry or uh, the vehicle etc how uh, they uh, manage that all those things uh, and also uh, the connection of uh, rivers uh, with the coastal area that is also very crucial for exchange of knowledge exchange of craft material uh, and exchange of raw material also that's a very very important if you see this map uh, of uh, uh, Ghaghar having lot of sites in uh, the Cholistan region as well as uh, the uh, Ghaghar, the Cholistan uh, in the Pakistan, that Hakra, they also call Hakra. And then Indian side, uh, this is uh, uh, Ghaghar or uh, Saraswati, ancient Saraswati. And also uh, Viswatwati river is also here. And if you see the Kalibanga side, the two river meets together here, uh, Viswatwati and uh, Gagar also. So there is a lot of sites uh, uh, dated from uh, before 5000 BCE. Uh, so this map, and if you see uh, the river system, uh, all those river, even the uh, uh, this Indus and Saraswati, uh, uh, just uh, disseminating here itself. That is so at present. This is a run of Kutch. And we have a lot of sites, trail of sites here, a uh, uh, run of Kutch, like uh, here, Dhalavira, and uh, at this point, Lothal, uh, that connecting a great run and uh, the little run also. And the river system, if you see uh, another Mahi and uh, 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 other river is also uh, Narmada uh, connecting here itself. So that is the reason uh, from this area, to uh, here, uh, the upper a little run of Kutch, having lot of sites uh, to manage the coastal area. So the relation of uh, uh, this uh, river system is very, very important for understanding of development of trade uh, and other uh, uh, sharing other things. Uh, I, I'm not going in the detail. So I have excavated two important sites and now uh, this is Rakhigadi here and uh, here in the Pakistan border uh, of uh, Binjor. So I'd like to show some of the photographs, some of the important finding on that. And uh, within uh, this huge, uh, this area from uh, here to uh, uh, the whole area, 
there is a lot of site uh, uh, excavated, explored, and uh, plotted there uh, in between. That has the smaller site also, uh, the bigger site like Baror, uh, uh, Binjor. Binjor is a smaller, but uh, very, very important. Uh, the Kalibanga uh, uh, and uh, Rakigari, etc. It's a bigger site. In between, there is a lot of smaller site also. Uh, so understanding of bigger site, smaller site, that give us the idea of village settlement, semi-urban settlement, urban settlement, uh, and uh, the relation between all, all those things, uh, all those settlements. So this is uh, very, very important for understanding. So uh, yes, these are the history. If you see uh, the uh, divisions uh, made by several scholars that uh, write from 7000 BC of uh, early food pro uh, producing era, and also uh, the Harappan period like Hakra, Ravi, having the distinct, little distinct uh, feature of pottery and settlement pattern also. Then for region uh, phase, uh, and the mature phase of Harappa, uh, we can uh, also uh, divide into ABC of Harappan phase that right from uh, 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE, and then late Harappan phase and then a regional uh, phase also. But in between intrig intrigation era of 2600 to 1900 BCE, there is a lot of chalcolithic site. So, uh, and their uh, interrelation between uh, the chalcolithic site is uh, very, very important. Now, uh, I come to excavation at Rakigari. Uh, the last two years, I'm uh, excavating uh, Rakigari on uh, several mounds. Uh, uh, we all know the Rakigari uh, excavated earlier also by uh, two of the uh, uh, scholar uh, and uh, dawn of uh, Indian archaeology, Dr. Amrin Nath uh, from Institute of Archaeology of ASI, and after that, uh, Professor Vasan Sinde, and uh, they have done a very very interesting work, uh, particularly related to burial and DNA study. Uh, but still, the enigma of Rakigari is how uh, to address the problem of different mound, that is mound number 4, 5, uh, 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, etc., that located uh, more than uh, 400 hectares. So uh, it's one of the largest sites uh, in the Harappan civilization. But we still don't know uh, the relation between all those mounds and then settlement pattern of Iraqi uh, Because it's a very, very crucial that uh, this is a largest settlement. If this is the largest settlement of our pan civilization, so it must have the several uh, 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 several component for uh, better understanding of Harappan culture, uh, particularly. Yes, uh, uh, the, uh, Professor Nath, uh, Dr. Nath has already been given an uh, entire chronology uh, right from uh, 6000 BCE to 1900 BCE. Uh, there is a lot of dates, carbon dates, uh, and uh, this is uh, right from the discovery. And now it's declared as an iconic site, five iconic site in budget announcement. So uh, the micro, uh, these are the milestones of uh, uh, excavation earlier. So we try to excavate uh, uh, two mounds primarily. One is mound number one and uh, uh, mound number three. Mound number three has not been uh, excavated by any of the uh, excavator earlier. So we try to tap mound number three, and mound number uh, one has already been excavated by uh, Dr. Nath, but still we try to understand the planning of uh, mound number one and nature of mound number one. So this is the overview of uh, 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 last year excavation. This is a street of different level. 
of mature harappan uh, 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 within the mature harappan at least three uh, phase of street we can see here and this is the turning of the street uh, north to south this is east to west and then again turning to uh, north to south so this is the one sector so uh, it's like a uh, cutting of the sector uh, uh, planning of uh, almost uh, 18 meter of one sector so we don't know uh, the north south expansion mm -hmm. whether it's a uh, uh, same 18 meter or this is a rectangular or that uh, we don't know at present so there is uh, several structure within this uh, complex of both side of the street uh, so this is very very interesting to understand the town planning particularly or settlement pattern particular, particularly in mount number one the similar kind of pattern we have seen in mount number three also you can see uh, here the burn brick structure uh, along with the drainage system of uh, so this is the closer view uh, the burn brick structure along with uh, uh, and some of the cattle remains we found within the uh, structure see uh, uh, this is combined with uh, burn brick with the uh, mud brick structure and some of the soap pit and uh, uh, of different period you can see uh, the, this is a different view of that so now uh, we have also taken uh, uh, one trench at rgr7 uh, and we, uh, we have excavated two uh, burial of mature harappan phase interestingly in below the mature harappan phase uh, there is uh, uh, more than two meter deposit of early harappan phase so this is also very very interesting part and we have some upsidal structure here uh, uh, with the white clay the similar kind of upsidal structure we uh, uh, noticed at uh, binjor excavation also and there is uh, uh, some pit uh, very close to the sacrificial pit of uh, cattle animal bones uh, and uh, some of the uh, fireplaces uh, there also we don't know uh, whether it's an altar or a uh, fireplace within that so uh, this is one of the skeleton uh, uh, oriented north south little tilted and these are the offering vessels uh, at the header side uh, and also one copper mirror uh, small miniature copper mirror we found uh, with the skeletal remains and some of the uh, shell bangle uh, in the hand also uh, so shell bangle is very very important because that is not a local product so that also shows the relation uh, or contact between the coastal area particularly in the Gujarat region interestingly in Ardia uh, just close to uh, the small number six we found uh, uh, a, in a chance discovery by the villagers a harpoon copper harpoon that is the marker of uh, ocp copper hoard culture of upper ganga or ganga yamna dwab uh, so we got this and after that we try to excavate uh, that particular uh, field uh, of three places and we got lot of ocp uh, type pottery uh, there so uh, it's a very very interesting to understand that whether this uh, this was the either played a vital role for context of uh, upper Ganga Yamna Dwarf culture with the Harappan culture itself either in the local period or because it's a separate mom uh, that is not overlap with the Harappan in RGR one but still uh, we try to understand the relation between two. So if you see uh, the material of various material like stitite, microbeads, disc bead, uh, terracotta beads, semi precious stones bead, aged car carnelian bead, uh, aged carnelian bead, lapis uh, here, lapis, and then pendant uh, is also here, the fish hook, copper fish hook, antimony rod, uh, the copper bangle, and the raw material also. If you see the unfinished bit of raw material, we got uh, 
plenty of unfinished lead core uh, etc which is a foreign material that is not uh, the locally available material so that is uh, interesting to understand the relation uh, between the coastal land or the gujarat other uh, harappan site uh, so if you see the multiple terracotta that also reflects the relation between animal and uh, the human being uh, of uh, that culture uh, the human terracotta uh, it's a very close to uh, 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 that uh, uh, met a stone uh, terracotta found in harappa and also uh, the lohanipur uh, torso uh, of jaina sculpture so uh, artistically it's a uh, very close uh, uh, yes uh, the gap is uh, too much but uh, uh, it shows uh, the continuity of uh, artistic expression and style uh you can see uh, the uh, various animals uh, uh the bull hay uh, and the, the uh, jointed one also uh, uh, the collar dog uh, the famous collar dog dog and uh, these are the human uh, uh, <coughs> one of the copper mirror and uh, the copper object and the gold uh, fillet also uh, reported there and uh, various uh, seal ceiling uh, found in uh, excavation and graffiti also the various type of uh, miniature pot as well as uh, the other style of pot that shows uh, the har harappan uh, uh, mastery on the uh, pot and variations that also shows the complex society and developed society uh, they have used a uh, multiple type of uh, vessels Uh, in his uh, lifestyle so see the perforated jar uh, to uh, uh, story jar also uh, now uh, uh, yes there is lot to talk about uh, uh, the rakhi gadi i i thought uh, professor sindhe will also uh, uh, throw on uh, a light on their excavation uh, at rakhi gadi so i am not going much detail on that so now uh, uh, come to the binjor another end of uh, uh, saraswati river particularly in indian side uh, we have taken a lot, lot of you can see the landscape uh, just uh, here the 5 km away the pakistan border is there uh, so uh, site uh, located between paleo channel uh, to paleo channel of ghaggar uh and normally uh, all those sites uh, located around 500 meter away from uh, the present channel so maybe the earlier channel is little wider uh i do uh, see uh, the entire section uh, measuring uh, around 7.5 meter fortunately in rakhi gadi also mound number 1 having the similar kind of deposit of 7.5 meter so uh, 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 in the excavation uh, now we have a lot of a uh, good understanding of development of harappan culture uh, not only uh, the pottery style uh, but uh, in the other cultural component like development of uh, brick sizes as well as uh, the seal uh, development of seal right from the smaller button like seal to terracotta seal so very good evidence of uh, in a stratification of seal so we can understand the development of script also uh, from symbolism to the com combination of animal and uh, a, a script writing and also the only script in after that there is no animal at all uh, so this development is uh, uh, may give uh, the lot of idea for decipherment of indian script how script developed uh, in a, a long long time uh, having uh, uh, the combination of uh, uh, both uh, a depiction of animal and also uh, the script together 
and after that segregation uh, uh, of the script uh, only that is not in uh, uh, the pictorial one so that's uh, so uh, this is one of the uh, evidence uh, we got because this site uh, throws a light that uh, the entire site is craftsman's village the industrial one uh, having if you see uh, this site and the water structure is also there uh, the hearth and uh, the same place we uh, got seven weights of different denomination uh, the stone implements uh, and chisel uh, the pots etc and the same floor uh, of craftsman village so that's a very very uh, important for understanding of craft and uh, the process of their making we got more than two, uh, 250 uh, hearth and fireplaces that include variety of fireplaces, size, shapes, and sediment in between, and also the craftsman's uh, hearth or pot hearth to uh, control the heat and fuel. And uh, uh, so that's a very, very interesting evidence we got. So if you see the artisan's village or artisan's workshop, uh, see uh, the water uh, uh, container uh, made of the uh, wedge shaped brick uh, uh, and uh, 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 the hearth, uh, regular, a uh, lot of hearth here and uh, the floor, etc. Uh, another, uh, uh, the similar kind of evidence in dif uh, uh, different range lot of hearth uh, at, at the regular interval and see the variety of hearth uh, together. Uh, so uh, the series of hearth in one place and then uh, if you see the connecting hearth, uh, the uni shape and a rounded one having the connecting hearth, the two hearth together. So there is several variety of hearth that has not been recorded earlier of any of the sites. Uh, why hearth is important? Because that's the marker of whether it's a domestic hearth, whether it's an industrial hearth, uh, whether it's a kiln, uh, whether it's a, a smelting hearth, or uh, uh, the secondary kind of hearth for making ingots, uh, the pot hearth for the craftsmen. So that entire thing is related to the lifestyle of uh, hearth ones or their uh, trade, craft plans, technology uh, advancement, etc. Fortunately, we got uh, uh, within the two hertz, the element of copper uh, that analyzed uh, in, by the Bezwal Sani uh, Institute. So that shows the copper smelting and copper working hertz also uh, for the first time. Uh, the interesting is one fire altar we got in uh, northwestern side uh, corner of the mound uh, just close to uh, the rampart uh, having octagonal EST and uh, the entire sediment within the uh, fire altar is entirely different from uh, the other 250 hertz. Uh, this has the sticky soil inside maybe pouring some kind of uh, uh, whether it's a uh, 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 animal fat or ghee, etc., in uh, within that, and also uh, the grains. So that is uh, uh, that shows the belief of uh, the harpan. Uh, so another uh, uh, interesting uh, place having industrial activity. Uh, another interesting finding uh, from the uh, whether uh, it's a solitary finding also. Uh, the seven uh, lumps together. Uh, uh, this is the lumps having multiple grains, uh, evidence of multi offering of multiple grains. And then a recent article published in the Nature uh, uh, by the uh, combination of uh, scholars. And just close to it, we got a upsidal uh, structure and also uh, the offering place. Uh, together with one of the fragment of seal and two bull uh, along with Dishonestan and some uh, animal bones also. 
at the site itself in northwestern corner this is also along the side of uh, a fortification or uh, enclosure wall similar pattern uh, we are uh, having uh, just recently two days back at rakhi gali along we have identified a small number c uh, the outer fortification wall along with the outer fortification wall there is lot of activity of earth of different kind of uh, material is there uh, in future uh, maybe uh, we try to understand uh, whether the harpas are doing the ritual along with the uh, fortification or close to the fortification also uh, we try to understand so now a uh, uh, lot of uh, other evidences see the post firing painting of uh, 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 the pattern of birds and a uh, lot of uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, animal uh, like uh, it's a like a, uh, a, a tiger or uh, the similar kind of painting uh, we have seen in kalibanga also so uh, the profusely painted painted pottery we got from so you can see the various type of pot of early harappan having mustach design uh, in, uh, on the pot also uh, uh, so see uh, the variety of uh, uh, this is the entire uh, setting you can see the various uh, trees uh, two three type of trees the birds uh, and the deer uh, uh, in this the profusely painted s uh, uh, jar and uh, one of the spizal having a gold uh, gilding also there is a gold file having here this is uh, uh, and uh, the gold and semi precious stone you can see the gold bead and semi precious stone so you can see how they are making the jewelry uh, type uh, so various object you can see the razor uh the chisel uh bangle etc the uh, 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 two or three bangles together also you can see the antimony rod uh, or hair pin that is there in c2 uh, some of the uh, uh, human figurine having a, a, a set of uh, garland uh, these are the uh, uh, see the seal uh, of uh, unicorn along with the script this is last phase of seal having only script on terracotta and uh, right side uh, the, the terracotta ceiling uh, yes uh, thank you very much uh, i think uh, i i have taken a lot of time uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, dr manju uh, it was really very interesting to get to know about the new findings uh, and back to from the upper Bangla dog area, uh, which uh, really generally we are not aware of. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. And thank, thank thanks you. a lot for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is our pleasure. So uh, can we shall we invite uh, Professor Vasan Shinde for the next lecture? Is the professor Ashwin Singh Shinde's lecture is continued research over a century and changing perspective of Harappan civilization. Professor Shinde, we are very glad to have you, and I am also very personally very glad, glad to see you after a long, long time. Bo Matiyali, please. Yeah, we have can a, I uh, can I introduce him or please do? And I think if you have a, a PowerPoint, that too can be uh, arranged to be shown. Do you have a PowerPoint, Professor Kande? Yeah, I have PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. So please. Uh, I I will share maybe from here. Yes, please. I I am sure you will be able to do that. And before that, uh, our secretary, Dr. Oh. Professor Basant Sindhi, former professor and vice chancellor, 
at the Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute, Deemed University, Pune, and Founding Director General, National Maritime Heritage Complex and Museum, Lothal, and presently CSIR Bhatnagar Fellow at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, CCMB, Hyderabad. He is a world-renowned archaeologist, come museum expert, and one of the foremost scholars in South Asia. Professor Shinde is also adjunct professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, BHU, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Hyderabad, and the Central University of Haryana. Professor Shinde is also advisor to the Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways, Government of India on the National Maritime Heritage Complex and Museum. Professor Shinde has been teaching the postgraduate course in archaeology since 1982. In addition to being a recognized postgraduate teacher and research guide at Deccan College, Deemed University, University of Pune, Solapur University, and what uh, was Lauren University of Science, Budapest, Hungary. He has been also conducting teaching for the postgraduate diploma course at the Institute of Archaeology, Archaeological Survey of India, New Delhi, since 1991. In addition to his teaching activities, Prakash Sinde has also supervised a vast number of MA and PhD research students. Professor Shinde has been a pioneer in archaeological research since the last 43 years, specializing in the proto-history of South Asia, maritime history, as well as field archaeology. Professor Shinde contributed immensely to the development of concept and academic concept academic content for the first National Maritime Heritage Museum at Lothal. He has also directed a vast number of excavations around the country from Harappan sites in Gujarat and Haryana to uh, charcoalithic sites in Madhya Pradesh and the Deccan to proto-historic and early historic sites in Rajasthan and Maharashtra. Presently, he has been directing a very prestigious international research project at the large, largest Harappan site of Rakhigan, Haryana. <laughs> Professor Shinde has been teaching the postgraduate course in archaeology, sorry. I think uh, hmm. yes. that, that is enough, perhaps. Yes. We can start now. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yeah. The screen is visible? Yes, yes. Yes, it is. You are not audible, Dr. Shinde. You have to unmute. No, no, please you have to unmute. Unmute, please. No, no, 
know, you have changed the settings. You you have changed. The, you have put the microphone access off. Uh, that, that other screen. You just open that other other screen. Just few minutes back. You have opened that other screen, na? In the settings. I think. Uh, and Dr. Shindhya, please unmute. If you rejoin, I can. Uh, I. It will be easier to. No, no. You okay. click. Click on this. Open microphone access. Click on this. Open. Ah, and then you, this on the top, you put on this, on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you will be audible. Speak, speak, please speak. Now unmute, unmute, now unmute. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I will share my screen now. Yeah, yeah. My screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, Ranjana ji for inviting me here. I am happy to see some of my friends. Uh, also, a uh, lot of students. So, uh, I'll be basically speaking about uh, the research uh, that is carried out over a period of 100 years. Just give you a glimpse of that and uh, the contributions that, you know, that these researchers have and how the perspective of the Harappan culture is changing from time to time. So, that is, uh, you know, the main aim of my research. So if you look at the glints at the uh, research of the Harappan period, uh, you know, Harappan you know, civilization and the Harappan culture, then we can divide this into three phases, the before 1970, after 1970, and from 2000 to present. Now, before 1970, uh, of course, the aim was to establish the characteristic feature of the Harappan culture, uh, to understand the Harappan civilization and also to find out the extent of the Harappan you know, culture over a large area of the northwest part of India and Pakistan. And then, of course, after 1970, uh, the uh, efforts were made to define uh, different phases of the Harappan culture. Also, the efforts were made to understand the transition from early Harappan to the mature Harappan and also the decline of the Harappan, Harappan culture. So these are, you know, some of the important, you know, uh, aspects that were considered between 1970 and uh, uh, 2000. And uh, after 2000, of course, there is a, a paradigm shift because a lot of new uh, uh, research methodologies were introduced, a lot of new scientific uh, uh, methods, scientific analysis of the Harappan material was carried out. And today, in fact, we have got a clear idea about uh, what are the, you know, overall uh, understanding about the Harappan history. Uh, we know about the Harappan people, uh, about their diet and the health of the people. So a lot of uh, research has been, uh, has been carried out in this particular respect. Now, the beginning, of course, you know, it goes back to the beginning of the discovery of the Harappan, uh, these two iconic sites, the site of Harappa, which was the first site to be discovered, uh, and then secondly, 
uh, the site of Monjadaro. Of course, the, the site of Monjadaro was known, in fact, uh, before the excursion started at uh, Harappa also. Uh, in 1911, uh, the site was known, and I will show the person right now who brought the site to the notice of the uh, professionals. But these are the two iconic sites, and the general tendency is that we compare most of the other Harappan sites uh, to these uh, two iconic sites uh, in terms of maybe their their chronology, in terms of maybe material culture, and also overall transition uh, from the beginning till the end of the Harappan culture. So, uh, you know, this number of scholars have visited uh, the site of Harappa before the excursion started. So all of you may have heard about the uh, visit of Charles Mason. Uh, he was an antiquarian and he visited the site in 1826. Then uh, uh, 1831, Alexander Burness, in fact, the British lieutenant, also had visited. They had collected some material from the site. So, uh, you know, this before the excavation also, the site was known. And some serious efforts were made by Sir Alexander Cunningham, who became the first Director General of the Archaeological Service of India. In fact, Cunningham made a number of visits uh, to the site of uh, Harappa, and he had discovered a number of uh, material culture uh, from the site. And he also had published uh, some data uh, of the material that he, he had collected. So uh, the stories that uh, and the uh, reality is that uh, when the uh, Lahore Multan la railway line was being built, uh, the uh, site of Harappa was uh, being destroyed because the bricks were rocked from that site and they were used for laying the ballast for this uh, railway line. And that was stopped, of course, you know, this, uh, the destruction was stopped at some stage. And then, of course, you know, uh, the first, the uh, Director General of the Archaeological Service of India, Sir Alexander, sorry, uh, Sir, uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, John Marshall, in fact, you know, he started the work uh, at the site of uh, this uh, Harappa. So, Dayaram Sani, in fact, you know, he also has contributed immensely to the uh, uh, understanding history of the Harappan culture. He was part of the excavation. Also, in 1921, uh, uh, R.D. Banerjee, in fact, started to work at the site of Monjolo. Even though the credit goes to John Marshall for the excavation at these two sites, a lot of Indian scholars also had done a lot of work. And uh, these are some of the scholars uh, who had done tremendous work. Then uh, we should also uh, remember the uh, contribution made by D.R. Bandarkar. He was the first, in fact, to uh, bring out uh, the importance of the site of Mohanjadaro to the scholarly world in 1911. That is how the site, you know, was was known to the you know archaeologists. And then, of course, you know, the uh, work was started at this site. So some of the earlier publications, some of the seals that were discovered, they were published. Then you know you know that you know that even though the work was started uh, in 1920 the excavation at these two sites uh, for four years it was not known uh, what are the what is the antiquity of the remains uh, that is being excavated at these two sites. Only on 20th September 1924, uh, the announcement of the discovery of the Harappan civilization was made by John Marshall uh, by publishing the first article in illustrated london news on the uh, on the finds from these two sites and that is how the you know people came to know about this uh, before the discovery before the identification of the sites it was thought that you know that there is a gap in fact in the history of uh, south asia and it was mentioned by scholars like vincent smith that india jumps from stone age to the, to the stupa period or the buddhist period but uh, with the discovery of the harappan culture uh, that so-called gap, there was no gap, of course, but that so-called gap was uh, filled in. And then, of course, you no know, extensive work uh, started uh, around the sites, both the sites, and a lot of sites, a lot of important sites uh, were also discovered uh, in the Indus, uh, particularly in the Indus uh, River Basin. 
but uh, these two sides you know today what we know about the harappan urban life is because of the uh, excavations carried out at these two sites uh, by john marshall and his team the site of harappa and monjdaro uh, these two sites were excavated very extensively and a lot of data was recovered from the two sites and that data was used in fact for the reconstruction of the uh, harappan culture and the harappan civilization so john marshall you know when he discovered this uh, remains at the site of harappa and also at monjdaro he had called them as the indo sumerian uh, culture in fact in the you know in the beginning uh, in 1925 26 Uh, but later of course you no know, uh, the term was dropped and the term harappan culture harappan civilization was introduced i think some scholars have already spoken about the different terms used for the same culture and today of course you no know, we use uh, mostly harappan and the uh, saraswati civilization so these are the two terms you know which are quite popular in the indian subcontinent rd banerjee's uh, contributions are immense in fact you know he has uh, he joined the excavation and uh, carried out uh, really you know the real person who excavated the remains at monjdaro was uh, rd banerjee but his, his contributions were never uh, highlighted properly uh, but now of course you know we have realized the importance of his contribution and we are working we are trying to understand his contribution to the harappan research uh, uh, you know these two sites uh, were excavated on large scale ng mujumdar was another uh, scholar uh, who has contributed immensely he explored in fact you no know, lar- larger part of scene and uh, discovered uh, some of the important sites like amri uh, which is a very important early harappan site uh, in the indus river uh, basin he also tried to uh, generate a general chronology of the harappan civilization uh, based on dates from mesopotamia and uh, he had suggested perhaps you know the discovery could be as old as maybe 2500 bc in the initial stage which was later confirmed then several sites were discovered by ng mujumdar uh, when he carried out survey between 1929 and 30 and 30 and 31 and some of the important sites uh, that were studied by him and discovered like chandudar was discovered he studied amri site gaji sha uh, then uh, lomjo daro ali murad and uh, pandivai etc all these important sites were discovered uh, by him in this then also we can remember the contribution made by uh, sir oral stain because oral stain had carried out very extensive research uh, in the saraswati basin in 1939 and 40 and uh, he has mentioned in fact uh, some of the important sites uh, in that region and uh, he really is pioneer in fact you know in discovering sites in the saraswati region uh, he also excavated uh, or studied the material in fact from the site of uh, rangpur which was excavated by wards and uh, also uh, we should remember the contributions of uh, ross uh, in uh, he, which he which he did in part in the baluchistan region macke joined the work uh, at uh, the site of uh, harappa and mohenjodaro and macke came from the background of uh, the mesopotamian archaeology because he was a part of the two iconic sites the ur and uruk uh, that were excavated in the mesopotamian region and he had suggested in fact some you know chronology for the harappan site based on his experience and uh, uh, material that you know he uh, studied at these two sites and uh, his contributions are also important uh, sir mortimer wheeler also carried out some excavation at the site of harappa and uh, he was the first to introduce or uh, br- bring to our notice the pre harappan phase in the indian subcontinent uh, which is now of course the early harappan phase uh, so his contributions are also important we need to remember when india was divided only two sites were on the indian side most of the known sites went to pakistan and only only kotla nihang khan in punjab and rangpur in 
Savarashtra region of uh, Gujarat, they were known. And as uh, Sanjay has mentioned that, you know, then large scale excavation explorations were planned on the Indian side. And uh, of course, uh, you know, some of the persons you know, who have contributed uh, in the uh, identifying the extent of the Harappan culture. Uh, their Walter Fair service, he did some work in Pakistan. Then uh, uh, Dicardi, uh, she also carried out work in Pakistan. Then, of course, uh, some of the Indian scholars like D.P. Agrawal, he, he established the chronology of the Harappan culture. Then Jarij, uh, uh, Jeb Jarij, he did uh, very extensive work at the site of uh, Mehergarh. Uh, Gregory Posse carried out uh, extensive work uh, in Savarashtra and discovered nearly 400 sites in that region. So these are the scholars, you know, which have contributed immensely. And then, of course, you know, the pioneer work done by uh, A. Ghosh, Amlanand Ghosh. Uh, in a real sense, you know, he uh, discovered uh, what he called as the pre harappan phase in the in the uh, Saraswati Basin. Now, before his work, most of the scholars were of the opinion that uh, the Harappan culture is confined to the Indus River Basin. But he discovered a number of sites, and not only the you know the uh, mature Harappan sites, but also the early Harappan sites. And uh, he suggested that you know that uh, uh, that perhaps the uh, development of the early Harappan phase was happening simultaneously in both Indus as well as the Saraswati. River Basin. So he also discovered some of the important sites like Soti uh, in the Saraswati region. And uh, Soti also has uh, important early Harappan material uh, which he studied. Then also uh, I would like to mention the contribution made by Katie Dalal, uh, who was uh, it, she was known as Katie Frenchman that time, uh, who became Katie Dalal later. Uh, but she carried out extensive work uh, in the desert part of Rajasthan, particularly in the Saraswati Basin. And uh, in 1970s, uh, she had discovered nearly 400, 450 Harappan sites in that region. So extensive, you know, research was carried out. But I would like to mention the contribution made by, you know, uh, Tesi Tori because he was the one, in fact, who visited the site of uh, Kalibanga in 1970. And then, of course, the site of site of Kalibanga was excavated very extensively by B.B. Lal and his team uh, when he was working uh, in the archaeological Sur of India. So the importance of Kalibanga is that uh, two distinct phases were discovered that time. One was what he called, B.B. Lal called as the pre-Harappan, which is now, uh, we call this as the early Harappan, uh, which was dated between, you know, uh, 3200 to 26, 2500 BCE. And then the mature, mature Harappan phase uh, from 2500 BC to 1800 BC. So for the first time in fact, you know, uh, through excavation, he established that, you know, that, you know, the early Harappan was present in the Saraswati Basin also. And uh, the mature Harappan phase has evolved from the early Harappan phase. So that is an important uh, excavation that was done. He also found for the first time uh, the remains of plowed field and these uh, remains were dated to 2800 because these were found below the deposit of the mature upper phase and uh, uh, this was the i think this is the only evidence of its kind uh, in the indian subcontinent and uh, he also showed that you know, the agricultural system that was introduced by the harappans that system has not changed it today and even today as, you know same pattern is being followed in the indian subcontinent he also discovered, uh, you know, the burials uh, at the site of uh, Kalibanga. So there were two kinds of burials. Of course, one is the pit burial, uh, in which uh, the extended burials were found, and the other kind was the pot burial, in which some remains, even ashes, were found. So it was suggested that you know, maybe even you know, some people, Harappan people, were also cremated that time because these spots contain ashes. But it was not confirmed whether these ashes belong to, uh, you know, the uh, cremation of the human, you know, uh, being or not. That is not confirmed. Uh, he also found, uh, you know, proper uh, town planning at the site of Kalibanga during the mature phase, and uh, the 
citadel and the lower town of this was recognized by him also he found the remains of tandoor and chicken so tandoor chicken was the contribution of the harappans that was also you know stated by uh, bb lal then also we should not forget the uh, immense contribution made by sr rao uh, he carried out extensive work in the saurashtra region and two sites particularly the site of lothal and also the site of rangpur was excavated by him again and uh, uh, one of the important contributions of sr rao uh, is the discovery of a, a, of a dockyard compound at the site of lothal and of course you know, uh, the number of uh, sites were also discovered yeah, in the uh, in saurashtra and kutch part of gujarat and some of the important sites uh, like nageshwar then kanewal kuntasi uh, were excavated by uh, ms university and uh, deccan college so these are i will like to mention uh, show some of the remains from the site of uh, lothal the first site to establish that harappan had contact with outside world because he found these two uh, the seal particular you know, persian seal at the site of uh, lothal he also found uh, this uh, copper ingot bunch of copper ingot uh, similar remains are also found in the persian gulf so he claimed that you know, the harappan had contact with the persian gulf region then this is that structure uh, which he excavated and which he called as the dockyard and today of course you know, we believe that it is a dockyard and uh, uh, this is a very very important discovery perhaps the first dockyard anywhere in the world uh, developed by the harappans uh, he also found in the lower levels the what he called as the micaces redware pottery and uh, that was an important discovery because at lothal also there is a early harappan phase and the mature harappan phases evolved from that then when the pottery from saurashtra was studied by gregory posel then he found some regional diversity of the of the harappan culture and that regional diversity was uh, studied by him and uh, i will mention if i know what is the term that he has used but these are some of the important institutions you know kurukshetra university deccan college national museum they have done some pioneer work uh, in this in this respect now today now we have fairly good idea in fact uh, uh, about the extent of the harappan culture uh, we have you know, the northernmost limit in india is uh, manda which is uh, in in jammu region and then southernmost limit is uh, the border of gujarat and maharashtra and the site of bhagat rao is considered to be the southernmost limit and from saranpur district in up up to makran coast such a vast area was occupied by the harappans and this was possible because of the efforts made by number of scholars and uh, the area that was occupied is uh, calculated to be around uh, 2 million square kilometer which is almost double the size of pakistan such a large area was discovered or was occupied suraj bans work also are very important because he carried out extensive survey again in the saraswati basin and some of the sites like uh, rakhigadi in fact where identified by him then jp joshi's uh, work at uh, surkotra is very well, well known it is here that uh, the uh, bones of horse were found and also uh, jp joshi was instrumental in discovering the site of dholavira in 1965 such an important site also you know when it comes to the uh, contribution of suraj bahan not only he discovered the site of uh, uh, you know Gadi, but sites like Mitatal and Siswal were, were excavated and he suggested that you know that there was a regional culture before the Harappans in this region. Uh, now that regional culture is uh, now identified as the early Harappan culture uh, in the in this particular region. Then you know the sites like Kunal, Banauli, uh, these are such important sites excavated in the uh, in the Saraswati Basin. Particularly the Kunal is very important because uh, the dates of the beginning of the harappan culture here is going back to almost 5500 even the recent work done by uh, dr money and his team suggests that even the you know the dates are going back to 6000 bce so from 6000 to the beginning of the mature phase 
there's a proper you know transition at this particular site then banali was excavated by rs beast uh, here also he found the earlier upon and the mature upon phase and the remains of fortification uh, with bashan at this particular site uh, these are some of the important sites you know which were which were discovered uh, in Gujarat, of course, a lot of work has been carried out, uh, particularly, uh, you know, by uh, Gujarat State Archaeology, MS University, and to some extent, Deccan College. And these are some of the important sites. We have more than 450 sites in Gujarat, but these are some of the important sites uh, which have been excavated in Gujarat. So fairly good idea is, no, is uh, clear in fact about the extent of the Harappan culture and the nature of the Harappan culture in, in Gujarat. So the site of Dholavira, of course, is a very, very important site uh, in, in Kutch part of Gujarat. You can see the location of that here in the located in the desert part in the Khadir Island, surrounded by brackish land. And uh, RS Beast was the uh, archaeologist who excavated the site. This is the only site you know, which is divided into three parts, the upper town, middle town, and lower town, and each segment of the settlement was 45. So very good evidence about the town planning is found here. The excavation was uh, very, very extensive. He also discovered excellent evidence of water harvesting, water management. And these are some of the reservoirs, under, underground reservoirs, which were uh, used for storing water uh, at the site. Uh, you can see you know, the uh, water harvesting and water a management system at Dholavira. In fact, there are two small rivers. One is Manhar and the other one is Mansar. So these two rivers were dammed by the Harappans and the water was diverted inside the settlement. And these are some of the underground water tanks discovered by him uh, at the site. So unparalleled evidence of water harvesting and water uh, management was found at the site. The other important discovery, of course, you know, he found some open space between upper and middle town. And he thought that this is the stadium, perhaps the earliest evidence of stadium anywhere in the world. So that evidence, you know, is found. Perhaps this open space was used for maybe for conducting some sports, some ceremonies, some activities by the Harappans. Uh, you know, also, as I mentioned that, you know, this the site had a very very strong fortification wall and uh, some of the for the portions of the fortification wall discovered and excavated by him clearly indicate that uh, the fortification was very very thick and uh, for each segment there was a separate fortification these are some of the remains that he excavated the uh, other sites like nagwada uh, excavated by ms university now that site has a lot of evidence of uh, the shell working a uh, lot of evidence of the cell debitage and finished goods were found at the site so this uh, discovery has uh, led us to believe that the harappans have as, have also established some uh, industrial centers in fact for manufacturing certain goods because these goods had greater demand in the west and because of this they started making so this is the evidence and they also found more or less same evidence at the site of uh, Bhagasra, called, which is known as Gola Doro locally. So this site also has a lot of evidence of uh, shell working, uh, quite extensive. Then, of course, you know, the work at the site of Rosdi is very, very important. This is the site which was excavated by Gregory Posel. And why it is important? Because uh, before the excavation at the site of Rosdi, it was thought that, you know, the Harappans have have traveled from the Indus River to the to Savarashtra, and therefore the phase in Savarashtra, the Harappan phase in Savarashtra, could be later than the phase found in uh, in the Indus River basin. But uh, his work, in fact, at the site of uh, Rosdi, have dispelled this uh, uh, misconception because the dates that he found for the mature Harappan phase and also for the late Harappan phase, they were uh, you know, in sync with the dates found at Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. And therefore, he suggested that perhaps the phase found in Saurashtra was contemporary to the phases uh, that to the phase that was developed in the industrial basin. 
So this was a very, very important, you know, uh, research uh, that he carried out. But at the same time, you know, he noticed a different, uh, you know, uh, this uh, difference in the material culture. And he suggested uh, that, you know, probably, you know, there was a regional, regional manifestation of the Harappan phase in Saurashtra. And he, this particular phase in Saurashtra was termed by him as the Sorath Harappan phase. Though uh, this term that he has used is not accepted, but uh, the point that he wanted to make is that that one can see a regional diversity, and that regional diversity could be found in different ecological zones. Even in the Saraswati Basin, also we can see some regional diversity of the Harappan civilization. And uh, Posel had identified you know, seven different uh, domains of the regional diversity of the Harappan culture. And in this map, you know, you can see clearly this uh, different uh, notion. The work uh, at the site of Lotha, at the site of uh, Puntashi was also important because uh, after Lothal, one more port town was discovered at the site of Puntasi. Puntasi, we found some anchor stones and uh, we did carry out some experiment whether these anchor stones are effective or not. So we did that in fact at the nearest port called port called Naulaki. So that work was very important. Uh, here, you know, we found a lot of uh, evidence of uh, JT and furnaces uh, and a lot of evidence of the manufacturing activity at the site. So what you are seeing in, in fact here is the main uh, industrial complex in Puntasi uh, where we have the evidence of uh, manufacturing different crafts at the site. And probably you now, like Lothal, this site also was connected uh, with outside world. Then the site of Padri that was excavated by me, uh, this is also an important site. And the first site where we would suggest that you know, perhaps the salt farming was done at uh, Padri because the site is located very close to the area, which is ideal for salt farming. Uh, so this is also an important site. And uh, we have also earlier up on and mature up on phase at the site. So this is the area which is close to the salt, you know, close to the site and ideal for the salt farming. Uh, Rafiq Mughal from Pakistan, uh, his contributions are also you know, equally important. He was the first to distinguish the earlier up on and the mature up on phase. The earlier up on phase, you know, which was termed by most of the archaeologists as the pre up on. But Rafiq Mughal was the first to suggest uh, that, uh, you know, the so-called pre harappan phase is actually the early Harappan. And then, of course, you know, when he was a director of the uh, Department of Archaeology in Pakistan, he carried out some important, you know, excavations. And uh, uh, some of the important sites like Jalilpuru, you know, were excavated by him. And he studied uh, the material culture from Kodiji, Amri, Iraq, etc. And uh, after the study only, you know, he could come to the conclusion that the remains found in the so-called pre harappan phase, they are actually the early harappan remains and from which the mature harappan phases evolved. Uh, Michael Janssen, uh, unfortunately, he recently passed away, but his contributions are also important because he did carry out the fresh excavations at Mohanjadro and he is trying, he tried to uh, date that uh, stupa-like structure at Mohanjadro and when I met him, in fact, in 2017, he mentioned to me that you now the stupa was not later, but built by the Harappans. So he was uh, working on that, but unfortunately he has died. But he has also produced a uh, you know, number of publications on Mohanjadro, and he has discussed the importance of this particular site. Then uh, Massimo Vidale, Vidale has worked extensively on the Harappan craft. Uh, Mark Kenoyer is, uh, of course, well known because he has also worked on the Harappan craft. He was also involved in the excavation site, uh, the site of uh, Harappa again. And you, you can see here, in fact, uh, the uh, two stalwarts, uh, Mark Kenoyer and Richard Meadow, uh, who started fresh excavations at Harappa. And uh, they have uh, developed this particular stratigraphy uh, in this particular area. So he, the early Harappan phase uh, in this part is dated 
uh, by between 5000 and 2600 BC. The mature urban phase between 2600 and 1900 BC and the later upon phase between 1900 and 1300 BC. So this uh, this uh, this chronological chart was provided by him by both in fact Richard Meadow and Mark Kenoy on the basis of their work at the site of Harappa, uh, the fresh excavations at Harappa. And then of course, uh, you know, the last work in fact, you know, which I did at the site of uh, Rakigadi of course, the first two years were you know, were spent in identifying the total area of the site, and we did some uh, some we did use some uh, latest geophysical instruments to prepare the you know, 3D maps of the site, also to un understand the total extent of the site, uh, which was not clear in fact before uh, our work. So we carried out GPS survey at the site. And today, of course, now we know that uh, we you know this is the largest Harappan city, uh, which is spread over an area of 550 hectare. Then the other important contribution of uh, Rakhigadi and also other sites like Farmana, Girawat, etc., which uh, I will mention later, uh, are that you know perhaps uh, we can understand the transition from early Harappan to the mature Harappan, and we have got uh, solid archaeological evidence in this particular respect, and. Uh, some of the you know, areas, uh, some of the important sites in the Saraswati Basin. Uh, the dates now are going back to 6 million BC in this region. So from 6 million, because we have got a number of sites now where we have early dates. And certainly 6 million BC date can be suggested for the beginning of the Harappan culture. So from 6 million to the development of the mature Harappan phase, you know, there is a constant you know, transition development happening in this region. Sites like Binjor, which was mentioned by uh, Sanjay Manjul, and Boror, uh, these sites also have contributed to our understanding about the craft industry in this in this region. Uh, Farmana, of course, now we did uh, extensive work at Farmana Cemetery, and uh, here also one of our research, one of our aims was to understand the Harappan uh, uh, genes, Harappan uh, chronology. So we have uh, succeeded in doing. Uh, to get some evidence in this respect uh, at this particular site. Uh, it was excavated very extensively and we have studied the burial custom and the material culture that were discovered in the burial burials. So we have discussed maybe some uh, socio-economic conditions based on the burial customs at Farmana. And then of course, you know, the site of uh, Rakigadi, you know, where we carried out the extensive work on the ancient uh, DNA, on the Harappan DNA. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, we are not done in pattern extensive work, extensive research, uh, extensive excursion at Rakigadi because our aims were different. But right? now we were only, you know, interested in understanding the chronology of the site, uh, which is now going back to 6000 BC. Then we also were interested in understanding the trenches transition from early Harappan to mature Harappan, for which you know, we have got very strong evidence, very good evidence. And the third important problem we, ha we had in our mind was to understand the Harappan uh, people, in fact, for which we did the uh, uh, DNA studies, the first of its kind in this region. So uh, uh, we did, uh, you know, to understand the uh, proper, uh, maybe chronology of the site, we excavated uh, a vertical trench, index trench on mound number four, and the total deposit uh, uh, on mound number four was 24 meter, perhaps the thickest at any Harappan site. So from uh, 6000 BC to 2400, 2500 BC, we have a very good you know, evidence of the transition uh, at the site. Uh, for excavation of burials and for studying the DNA, uh, we did take proper precaution, uh, you know, we changed the methodology of the excavation here of the burials and uh, this is how the, you know, the you know, proper precaution was taken. And because of this precaution, uh, we were succeeded in getting DNA. So we did a lot of, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, the cleaning and the extraction of samples in, in the lab. And, uh, you know, what the kind of study that we did in fact was something like this. We did, you know, uh, uh, we did first the anthropological, anthropological examination of the burials, uh, which were published extensively. 
We have done CT scanning for understand the craniofacial reconstruction of the Harappan people. We have also done, done the paleoparasitology. We have also done sampling for ancient DNA and stable isotope analysis and various other scientific analysis at the site. So because of this type, type of research, we were able to understand properly about the health diet uh, of the Harappan people. And finally, who are the Harappan people? So we know that now that you know, Harappans were the indigenous people uh, and they were responsible for the development in the Indian subcontinent. Then also we did some uh, reconstruction of the facial feature because uh, that was also done for the first time because we had no idea in fact how the Harappan people look like. So for this reconstruction, we need two uh, sets of data. One is the matrix data, uh, the, the measurement of the bones. So that was done when we were excavating at the site. And also we did the uh, CT scanning to understand or get data of the inner anatomy of the people. So that data was fed in fact in the computer. And we have shown in fact that, you know, how the Harappan people look like. In the upper photograph, you know, you can see the reconstruction of the boy, Harappan boy, maybe around 18 years old. And in the lower part, the uh, reconstruction of the facial feature of the Harappan woman. And the Harappan, you know, boy and the Harappan woman, in fact, uh, there's so much continuity when the modern people look like Harappans. So this is the kind of research that we've done. And now, now we know that, you know, what, who are the authors of the Harappan culture, who are the authors of the Harappan civilization. And uh, we know uh, fairly well about, you know, the kind of food that the Harappans have, you know, have included in the diet and overall contact of the Harappans beyond the hinterland area. So this is the kind of research uh, that was done uh, in the Indian subcontinent on the Harappan culture. And uh, the latest uh, approach is that you know, we want to uh, do a lot of outreach programs so that you know we can educate about you know the importance of the cultures, ancient cultures. And uh, if people are educated, perhaps they will come forward and they will participate in the preservation and protection of the uh, heritage. So that is the main aim, in fact, now of our research that we did. So I will stop here. And uh, again, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here and for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very yeah. much, Professor Shinde. It was uh, really very uh, helpful for general public and also for the students to know what work has been going on and how much light the recent work has uh, thrown on the problems that uh, Harappan civilization had. Thank you very much. We will go over now to uh, Professor Michel Danino. And uh, uh, his study is Persisting Riddles of the Indus Saraswati Civilization. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ranjanaji, for inviting me and the entire team at the Kolkata Society for Asian Studies. And uh, greetings to the stalwarts here, Dr. Mani, uh, Dr. Manjul, Professor Shinde, uh, and uh, also Professor Palab Sengupta. Uh, I will, uh, have it, being the last presenter, I'll have the benefit of uh, being able to shorten my presentation somewhat because I can avoid repetitions. Uh, let me try to present my screen and I hope, one second, I hope this will. Not able now to get, one second. I'm not able to get the desired window. Let me just see. Um, am I allowed to share the screen? Um, the earlier ones, they have done yeah, it. So. I think this should, this should work. Well, just, I'm sorry. Just, 
I think I'm allowed. It's just that. It's just that. I'm not able to select the particular window. One second. I think it should come. Hello. Do you want to So introduce Kole na to na ke. Jagle oni shuru kori. Huh. Maybe, maybe this works. Is, is yes, yes. Is my screen visible? Yes. 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 Right. yes. I will I will not take too much time because it's already quite late. Um, but I will simply ask a few questions about the few dominant riddles of this civilization which uh, have been quite persisting. Let me first since the back, historical background has been already made in great detail by the previous speakers, I would still like to highlight the fact that when this civilization was explored, um, and here we have a remark in the 1940s by Mortimer Wheeler, what um, was a bit disappointing to especially the Western archaeologists was that apparently there was nothing extremely striking of the kind that Egyptologists were encountering in ancient Egypt, like spectacular pyramids, uh, colossal temples, colossal statues, and so on. None of this was available here. Here you see Mortimer Wheeler complaining about the miles of brickwork, which uh, are aesthetically mines of monotony. So this is the difficulty which, uh, which actually was a challenge to popularizing this civilization, that yes, it was very widespread. It was also belonging to the Bronze Age, uh, third millennium BC, like the Egyptian uh, and other civilizations. Uh, but it was there was nothing very, very um, attractive about it, uh, apparently. And uh, uh, it took decades of hard work to actually bring out certain unique features of this civilization. And, and this is what I will partly try to highlight here. So the riddles are, first of all, how did this civilization come together over such a very vast uh, expense of possibly up to 1 million square kilometers, which is much more than contemporary civilizations in Mesopotamia or Egypt. And then how was such a vast region integrated in, I will come back to this, the absence of a military order. So what were the mechanisms that held it together? Was there a state? And if so, what was the state's structure? Uh, thirdly, and this has been a very enduring uh, topic of discussion and controversy among the scholars, uh, what were the causes of its decline? And if not causes, sometimes contributory factors. What could have been the mechanism which uh, after just about seven centuries of the urban phase, uh, contributed to the decline and ultimate disintegration of this civilization. And in particular, in that perspective, did climate change, did the collapse of the Sarasvati system play a part? Now, let me first of all start with something uh, far ahead of the mature phase. We are now in the 7th millennium BC in Balochistan, where, and we have heard that there are similar antecedent phases in sites like Birana, like uh, Kunal and others uh, in the Sarasvati Basin. Uh, the, so we find that there are already here established settlements. Mehrga remains the most important uh, because in, in Birana, in Kunal, in Rakigari, uh, no extensive horizontal excavations of that period have been possible so far. So here we find that there are vast settlements of Neolithic era, 200 uh, hectares or so in Mehergar, for example. And yet, without going into the, the description of those settlements, yet it is remarkable that there are already established trade networks. For example, Mehergar has Lapis Lazuli, but Lapis Lazuli comes from Central Asia beyond the Hindu Kush range. So, which is quite far away, probably 2,000 kilometers or so. It has also, as you can see, ornaments of seashells, and the sea is about 500 kilometers away. So therefore, right in the Neolithic era, 
and this is an area which, which requires much more study, we see that long distance trade networks are already getting established. And, and this is actually one mechanism which is going to amplify in the course of the following millennia and ultimately culminate during the mature or, or urban phase. So it's very important to understand those mechanisms because those uh, cities which we keep talking about, Monjo Daro, Harappa, uh, Dholavira, and so on, do not emerge overnight. They are the result of thousands of years of a slow, gradual evolution and buildup. Now, uh, this is a map of one particular, uh, one early phase uh, the, 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 in, the, in the fourth millennium BC, fourth and early third millennium BC, you have all these regional cultures which are not yet integrated. Uh, they are still, but they are communicating together and there are trade networks connecting all of them, but we still do not have cities in the accepted sense of the term. Uh, these are settlements, some of these settlements from the early Harappan phase. And this is a map which I borrow from Gregory Possel, uh, who we have just heard uh, about. And you can see that already in this early phase, we have pretty much the entire Northwest region. The, you know, the whole um, plains of the Indus and its tributaries. And already here, if you can follow my cursor, this is the Sarasvati River. And, and there's a continuity of sites uh, going uh, almost, I mean, right into what is today the Cholistan Desert. And there are also a few early Harappan sites in uh, the Gujarat region. Uh, there, during one such phase, early Harappan phase, this is called the Ravi phase, uh, which is in the fourth millennium BC, uh, you find this is a map by Professor Kenoya showing the trade networks from Harappa and the exchanges happening from Harappa. But then you can do similar maps from any of the major early Harappan sites. So therefore, there is a, a constant buildup and intensification of trade and trade networks. And then when we come to the mature phase, 2600 BC onward, we find that this Indus region, uh, Indus Sarasvati, of course, is, is trading with all these regions in Central Asia, in Mesopotamia, in Iran, this is all part of Iran today, in the, the, the what is today the Emirates, this was known as Dilmun in the Bronze Age, and Oman was known as Magan. So there is a, a, now an expansion beyond the Indian subcontinent. The, the one area which is not obvious is the Gangetic region. It's not clear because it was still in the Neolithic phase it's not clear there are suggestions, but not real proof, strong evidence of interaction with the Harappan civilization. So uh, when you go back to Mesopotamia, on the other hand, there's plenty of evidence, and this is a summary of some of it, ornaments, seals, uh, weights in the, in the Persian Gulf, and so on. And there the presence of the Harappan civilization is absolutely no longer in dispute. In fact, evidence has been multiplying uh, with a lot of uh, recent um, uh, research in, in sites of uh, the Emirates and uh, Oman uh, by um, Massimo Vidale, by Dr. Frenes, um, uh, Denis Frenes and others. So now we are in the uh, mature Harappan phase and you see the, the wide uh, networks. Uh, this map by Kenoya is partly based on the evidence uh, produced by Randall Law, who has done the most extensive study of all these networks of raw materials uh, traveling all over the region to craft communities that will turn them into finished goods that will then be uh, traveled further and exported even beyond the subcontinent. So uh, this is one more map, uh, again, by Professor Kenoyer. And therefore, the, the networks are fairly uh, clearly known, though there are sometimes big question marks remaining. For example, we were told that Lothal is exporting certain goods, but it appears that the sea route around the Saurashtra region may not have been the route that, that was used. And rather, uh, we are doing research on this at IIT Gandhinagar at the moment, rather a route 
cutting through to the uh, little run of Kutch and then the greater run of Kutch and probably connecting Lothal directly to Dholavira. This is still uh, something uh, uh, under research. So this is the, the, the map which uh, I drew uh, at some point of the entire civilization. Uh, the single channel for the Sarasvati River is a bit um, incorrect in the sense that the river had many channels and kept shifting, in fact, it, during its long evolution. But then you can see the density of sites in the Gangetic, uh, excuse me, in the Sarasvati Basin, uh, which apparently uh, were more numerous than in the Indus Valley proper. So this is one more reason why one more reason why the term valley, Indus Valley civilization, is is quite obsolete. It's obvious that the Sarasvati Basin, the Gujarat region here, were an integral part of this uh, civilization. So therefore, in the civilization, Harappan civilization, in the Sarasvati, Sarasvati Sindhu, all these terms are, are valid, but not in this valley civilization, though it is still used. Now, the big question is, fine, we see an integration probably through trade and exchanges of raw material and finished goods. But then when we come to the uh, mature Harappan phase, or where all those cities which I showed on the previous map, uh, uh, come up on the surface, then how do we explain? Uh, if I go back one second to my map earlier, it looks like one integrated city. And in fact, early scholars like uh, Raymond Alchin, Bridget Alchin and others sometimes spoke of an Harpan empire with Mohenjo-daro as the capital. So this was based on, you see, Western models of archaeology, uh, in, in, for example, uh, Egypt, in Greece, where you did have uh, empires. And, you know, these were replicated here, but there is no proof that this, this was actually an empire. Rather, the current thinking, and this was started, the discussion was started by Grigory Possel, among others, is that there were actually several sub-regions uh, of, of the civilization. And this is visible in the variety of uh, uh, of ornament styles, pottery styles, even though there are styles which are common to the entire civilization, there are also regional variations in all, all these. And, and this is, without going into details, the main domains, the main regions, which perhaps should be regarded as semi-independent or autonomous city-states, which were connected together through strong bonds of um, trade, culture, religion, uh, also technologies, and, and there was a very vibrant uh, network of exchange over the entire civilization. But nevertheless, these regions were somewhat autonomous in their own ways. Uh, and the question, therefore, is how do we define a state? And how do we, uh, because this is a big theoretical question that I will not go into, but rather how do we detect the presence of a state in the Harappan civilization. So much, of course, comes from the obvious presence of urban planning. I'll not spend time on these, and you are familiar with, with these uh, evidences and developments of, of um, urban planning in here in the Acropolis of Mohenjo-daro, um, and with further developments in terms of imposing monuments uh, the, this one is called the granary, though it was probably not a granary, but a warehouse. Uh, you have here the famous uh, great bath of, of complex of Mohenjo-daro. None of these would be possible without a certain authority, a certain administration. That is where we can perceive the presence of a state. Even in, in areas of the lower town of Mohenjo-daro, there is still planning. M maybe not as clean as in the Acropolis, but you can see here, major streets uh, which are broadly oriented north-south and east-west. And all of these complexes of houses are actually uh, separate blocks and platforms, uh, all of which was meticulously planned, in particular for the water management uh, to work, which we will see, and the sanitation um, system, which we will see shortly uh, to be effective. So uh, this is uh, one of the streets. and. Um, you have again the presence of fortifications at sites like Harappa, 
and many others, <coughs> Dora Vira, we have already seen from previous speakers. <coughs> and here we can also detect the presence of the state. Why fortifications? They were called initially defenses. Mortimer Wheeler in particular was extremely keen on imposing a military, military reading of these cities and these fortifications in particular. So defense is, is not a neutral term, which is why I prefer the term fortifications or even walls. And uh, they were also probably for protection of floods at some sites, definitely for the control of trade, because you can see here narrowed entrances into the fortified area, which allows the, the, the guards, the sentinels, to control the, the flow of goods, whether raw materials coming in or finished goods coming out, and probably some system of taxation was in place exactly as during the early historical phase of the, of the first millennium BC, where in all the Gangetic cities, in fact, if you look at the fortifications of sites like Koshambi, for example, you have, or, or Sheshu Palgar in Orissa, you have very, very similar patterns of narrow entrances, guards' rooms. And we know from the text at that time, for example, Artha Shastra, that these narrow entrances are meant to control the trade and to tax the, the, the trades, the tradesmen. So uh, also they could have been used to define the urban space. I will come back to this shortly. And as according to Piotr Eltsov, uh, Russian and American archaeologist, as a symbol of authority. I'll come back to this in a moment. So these are more of these sites. This is Kalimangan on the uh, river Gagar or Sarasvati. This is Lothal. We've already heard about these sites, so I can move fast. And this is the famous site of Doravira in the land of Kutch, where you have very rigorous town planning. Now, not just uh, two zones, uh, Acropolis and Lower Town, but three, because there's, there is a middle town. Now, such planning cannot easily happen without, especially when the patterns of urban planning are the same all over the entire civilization, cannot easily happen without the presence of a state. And, and this is the most tangible evidence for this. Uh, this is a reconstructed view of the uh, castle of Doravira with massive fortification walls and, uh, and ma very monumental gates. Mm -hmm. This is the northern gate uh, that comes down towards uh, the, the middle town. And facing the middle town, on top of this northern gate, was hanging this monumental three meter long uh, signboard. It is known, I mean, Dr. Bish, the excavator, called it a, a signboard. Uh, it was definitely, it has not been deciphered because, you know, the, the script is still undeciphered. Or rather, we have too many conflicting interpretations of the script, none of which uh, is accepted widely. But then we have here a unique evidence of a signboard three meter long, it was probably a, a plank of wood. And what remains here a, a below right is the, the gypsum uh, made, uh, you know, um, letters, each of them almost one foot high, uh, incised and placed in the supporting plank of wood, which has disappeared since then. And here there was a message for the entire middle town, which was below. And it would have been visible from there because it was so huge. So clearly, this is also the possible presence of a, of a ruler, you know, giving giving a message uh, to to the the population uh, of the city below. Uh, what was the message is completely open to speculation, and therefore I will not go into it. Could have been the name, a geographical name, the name of an event, uh, the name of the ruler. All of this is possible. We just do not know. But you see again the planning. The, the streets meticulously uh, aligned at right angles. Uh, and now another element for the presence of the state is the water management all over the civilization. Because we find that uh, uh, systems like, for example, wells with trapezoid bricks, there are 700 of them at least at Mohanjo-daro alone. Uh, this is something which cannot be uh, easily planned and implemented over the entire region without again a state structure. And even more so, more convincingly, the drainage system, the, the, the sanitation system. Here you see at, Mo at Mohanjo Daro, 
individual bathrooms on the left of the, this wall, and you have individual channels connecting to one domain, one main uh, uh, drain. We, all of this was, of course, buried. It has been excavated. It would not have been visible at that time in the street. But then this means that not only were the slopes of the, the, these drains, and uh, Mikhail Janssen, the German archaeologist who passed away recently, made a meticulous study showing that those slopes were constant over the entire city of Mohanjo-daro, one to two centimeters per meter, which means that there had to be a very, very meticulous planning of the entire uh, city, area per area, uh, so that the slopes would, would be workable. This is something that has to be embedded at the planning stage. You cannot do it later if the different levels of your platforms and your areas are not consistent. But the second message of this uh, photo is that you also need it because there will be accumulation of solid waste uh, in some of these drains. You needed a municipal force, just as we have today in modern cities, to go and regularly clean those um, uh, drains. Uh, you have similar drains on a smaller scale at Lothal. And you see here a, a drainage system within, first of all, within a house. You have the bathroom here and a private well in this case. And you can see that there is an underground drain now emerging into the public lane. And here you have a sump where solid waste will accumulate automatically. So the engineering is very, very rigorous and meticulous. But in addition, we know that the, if this sump is not going to be clean at regular intervals, the entire drainage system will collapse. But it was working for 700 years. So therefore, we have a municipal force. And this has to be controlled in turn by an administration and a state structure. A similar well, but now in stone at Dhoravira. And at Dhoravira, as already mentioned earlier, a lot of water management, I will, I will move fast. Uh, I will not go into the details, but this speaks a lot of enormous manpower. These colossal reservoirs, which were again maintained for the entire lifetime of the city, uh, and some of which had to be like this one, cut in the sheer rock, means hundreds and hundreds of workers for probably a few decades to create those reservoirs. And this is in an area which uh, today is, is almost uh, half, half very arid, let us say, not desert, but very arid. It would have been wetter in, in the third millennium BC, but nevertheless, it was not heavily populated. So certainly workers were imported from other regions, probably Sindh in this case, and therefore this means control of the manpower. It means the ability to pay the workers in some way, whether in kind or in cash, but there was no cash probably during the Harappan civilization. So probably more in kind. And therefore, again, a state structure controlling all this. Otherwise, it would not be possible. So therefore, to sum up, there is a presence of the Harappan state, uh, visible through urban planning, control of manpower, control of craft manufacture and trade, standardization of a host of features like uh, brick proportion, water management, seal manufacture, bean manufacture, weight systems, iconography, the script itself. And though some of these um, standardized features could have been uh, made by communities communicating together, for example, a community of town planners, a community of potters, a community of scene makers, nevertheless, it is so widespread over such a wide expense that it had to be controlled ultimately by a state. But then questions remain. If this is so, why do we have no clear depictions or glorifications of the rulers? There is no single figurine that you can confidently say this was the ruler. There is no you know, panel, no uh, bas relief, no fresco depicting some feet of uh, the ruler or magnifying the, the rulers. It simply is completely missing. There is also no clear palace architecture. Some large buildings are suspected of having been uh, places where rulers lived, but um, uh, there is no, no, no palace like there was in the uh, ancient Egyptian civilization that stood out in architectural terms. So therefore, should the entire upper cities or acropolises be seen as symbols of authority, which is what 
uh, Piotr Elstov has suggested. And also, no evidence, again, of military structure or large-scale warfare. Uh, so therefore, the entire civilization was hanging together through more subtle trends, like trade, like culture, and uh, it was not as there was in Mesopotamia or Egypt, a military, a military structure that kept control over it all. So how did it end? And there are this, the, the various hypotheses which are confronting us. Uh, you know, the, the old ideas of invasions, like the Aryan invasion, destroying the Indus cities, this is very largely abandoned today. First of all, because if at all there was an Aryan immigration, and there are very serious doubts for that, which I will not go into, of course, uh, it's a huge topic in itself. Uh, the conventional date is about 1500 BC or later. But then we know that by then the Harappan cities have already disintegrated. So therefore the question of invasions does not arise at all. Internal conflicts, well, that is possible if certain uh, tensions occur, for example, diminishing resources, but then there is no hard evidence for that either. A great drought from 2200 BC onward, there is evidence, I will show it in a second. Drying up of the Sarasvati, yes, it does seem to be now solidly established. Ecological degradation through overuse of resources is quite possible. Long ago, uh, Williams Fair Service did some calculations showing that uh, the, the, the forested areas of the Harappan civilization would have been put under great strain. And today, be, because we know that the climate was veering towards aridity, we can say that if this was happening, then, then uh, it would have possibly triggered a domino effect. Geographical overstretch has been proposed by uh, Professor Dilip Chakraborty long ago in the sense that this new civilization was perhaps too, too big to be held together. And again, especially if factors of stress, climatic or social or economic, uh, were, were you know, having a, a role in addition. So what is actually interesting, and then economic collapse if the trade with the Mesopotamian region ended. But there is some sign that today, that trade with the Gulf region was possibly continuing even during the late half phase. Now, in all of this, it's very important to distinguish between clear-cut causes, their consequences, and contributory factors, which may have not been primary causes, but then again, you know, the, if, if a chain reaction of causes uh, takes shape, then the, the contributory factors become very important also. So the debate is not uh, answered uh, in with finality, it is still being discussed. But what is very clear now is that there is all over the world, and you can see the different <laughs> regions here, there is uh, about 2200 to 2000 BC, a great drought. There is a shift worldwide towards aridity. And also the monsoon diminishes. So the monsoon, which uh, uh, is a phenomenon which started about 8000 BC after the last ice age and peaked around between sometime between six and 4,000 BC, uh, by 2000 BC, it, it gets significantly reduced. And therefore, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, um, uh, water resources that the Harappans might have been taking for granted uh, are now under stress. This is a, a climatic study, and there have been many more. Uh, again, it's not limited to the, the Indian subcontinent. It can be, it has been extended beyond, showing that, uh, and there are many uh, proxies for these studies, which I will not go into. Uh, the literature is, is available. Uh, and, and this shows that uh, by the end of the third millennium BC, there's definitely a more arid climate. So now if you have an arid climate, if you have overuse of ecological resources, like the Harappans, uh, you know, clearing forests, because they need fuel wood for the brick industry, massive brick industry, for their, for their um, uh, you know, craft industries, some of which are uh, very, uh, like the metal metallurgy uh, re requires a lot of fuel wood. So then we might go into, you know, an accelerating cycle of uh, a degraded environment and as well as a degraded climate also, that is to say hotter climate 
with less precipitation. So this seems to be one dominant feature for uh, this Sarasvati River here. This is the entire basin of it, where I'm showing you here uh, all the tributaries of, of which build up into the Sarasvati Basin. Uh, it's quite possible that these two factors, which I have highlighted, climatic degradation and environmental degradation, they are not identical. They can coincide, but they're not the same. Uh, it's possible that the collapse of this uh, Sarasvati system was due to the, the two factors together. And what do we mean by the collapse? We see here, and I will, I will show, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, we can see in the Matthew Harapan phase, a continuity of sight all the way to what is today the Indo-Pakistan border. There is a break here, which uh, uh, Dr. Rafik Mughal, the Pakistani archeologist had noticed in the 1970s, and which perhaps shows that the river was already unable to flow all the way to the run of Kutch. And there is a big cluster in what is to the Solistan Desert, which is probably fed by some paleo channels of this settlement. So we see this, and then we see that during, so uh, again, if you, if you have, uh, uh, if you can see here this map, this is the early phase. Uh, this point here is full of early Harpen sites. They disappear during the, the mature phase. And then during the post mature or late Harappan phase, all the urban phase of the central basin of the Sarasvati are gone. And you see, uh, uh, I will use different maps to make it clearer. Uh, this is again the mature phase with the blow up showing that we have a continuity of size all the way to, to uh, here, this is the international border. And you see that now during the late Harappan phase, this whole region, central region of the Sarasvati is abandoned. And all the late Harappan sites are clustering uh, in the Chotang uh, or Chotang or Chitrang system, which is identified with the Vedic Drishadvati River, and also the foothills of the, uh, of the uh, Shivalik um, uh, hills, where you have still a number of seasonal streams available. And then far away, fed by some independent channel coming from the settlers, you have in the Cholistan, you still have some quite a lot of late Harappan phase, uh, sites. So this is uh, the post 1900 BC picture, which shows that the, the Sarasvati River has by now disintegrated, at least in its central region. Uh, some streams remain in the upper regions. Now this means, an, uh, that uh, this is probably a major factor in the degradation, uh, disintegration of the Harappan civilization. Uh, I will move faster here because we do not really have to see all these technical details about how, uh, you know, various recent studies have shown that sometimes the, the Himalayan sources, these are the, these gray micaceous sands, are available close to the surface, but sometimes they are available only much deeper. What this tells us in a nutshell is that when you see the region between the Satlej and the Yamuna here, uh, running north, south at this point of uh, her bed, you see that this entire region is crisscrossed by paleo channels. And this is, uh, you know, recent work of the last 10 to 15 years. And, uh, and uh, I will not go into the details of all these paleo channels. The dominant one is the Gangar Hakra system, which uh, we've already heard of and I showed in the previous maps. And this, this completely disintegrates in the second million BC. Even though today, uh, resistivity studies, among others, have shown that there are huge reserves of paleo waters in uh, gray fuel sand, uh, which you can see in, in the legend of the, of the map. Uh, and uh, therefore, there is still a lot of water as a relic of the ancient Sarasvati system. This is another map of it. And um, uh, the debate has been uh, between two schools of thought. Was there no river left at all during the Harappan uh, mature phase? Or was there, as uh, here uh, Anirban Chatterjee and Jyoti Ranjan Roy and other researchers have argued, was there still a river flowing? and what was its condition. And here you see how they found sometimes Himalayan uh, micaceous 
sands um, uh, of glacial origins very close to the surface. But, um, and, and some of the dating shows, uh, you know, the, the latest uh, date is about 3400 BC, where there are still occasional glacial contributions to the system. So this is a very complex system, the Sarasvati system, where there are occasional revivals, at least from the Sarasvati, possibly also from the um, uh, uh, Yamuna River on the eastern side. But by and large, the glacial sources are gone during the mature Harappan phase, which is the third millennium BC. And therefore, we have now a rain-fed river, which is possibly um, perennial. And I will argue uh, quickly uh, here why I think that we have convincing archaeological evidence that the river was still perennial, but rain-fed. There is no contradiction between the two. We have a lot of rain-fed perennial rivers uh, in India, we do not need um, compulsorily glacial sources. And here you see that uh, Kalibangan is right on the edge of the river Kaga, which is Saraswati. Uh, this identification was made incidentally in the 19th century. It is not at all a recent identification. We see here um, Banamali, and you see uh, the dry bed. These are maps published by Archaeological Survey of India. And you see the dry bed of the Saraswati. We have Birana, more recently excavated by L.S. Rao and others. Again, the dry bed of the Saraswati. Now, these cities were thriving during the entire mature phase, and they needed river communication for the trade exchanges, especially. They could not have worked with just, you know, bullock cart communications. And therefore, this is good archaeological evidence that this river was in flow. Maybe a diminished flow, but still a manageable flow during the mature phase or broadly third millennium BC. So to conclude, the possible scenario is that aridity increases with likely impacts, by the way, on food production. This is something which uh, um, Gen uh, G uh, Jennifer Bates and others uh, have done a lot of work on this, a lot of new data on the agriculture um, um, uh, protocols or other strategies that the Harappans were following during the mature phase and during the uh, uh, late phase, which was quite a different context climatically. Then you see that uh, the Gagar is still in flow and could have received occasional contributions, as I said, from Satellite and Yamuna. But then it becomes uh, after, during the second millennium BC, the central system collapses and it becomes a seasonal foothill river. Whatever the cause may be, seismic, tectonic, or even purely uh, the deposits of, of uh, um, alluvium, uh, which forces the river to uh, divert its course. This is known as avulsion. There is an overuse of resources, which may have compounded the severity of the climate change. And then this climate change is now well documented. And also the possibility that um, Harappan civilization's economy could have been too dependent on external trade with regions beyond the subcontinent. And if so, with the collapse of these networks, uh, this could have affected a lot of uh, craft producing communities back home. Uh, even the internal state organization could have been also dependent on trade links. So uh, with the collapse of all these systems, did tension rise during dif uh, between different regions? This is to be considered, though there is, again, no hard evidence for it, and the overstretched factors. Finally, so we can say safely that all these factors together played a part, major or minor, major definitely as far as climate change, uh, river, uh, hydrological changes, uh, these were definitely major factors, but there could have been a lot of other factors. Uh, food, food availability definitely would have been affected by the climate and environmental changes. Also, let us not forget that we have lessons of sustainability as far as urban sustainability is concerned and rural sustainability is concerned. Urban sustainability is far more fragile this is what the Harappan civilization shows us. And here we may have lessons for the 21st century. The, uh, the rural factor, uh, the rural sites and lifestyles 
are far more sustainable and they did continue and ultimately they kept evolving into different regional um, fragmented uh, cultures which however tried to come back together and rebuilt in the late second millennium and early first millennium bc rebuilt networks which ultimately crystallized into what sometimes is called the Gangetic civilization or the early historical civilization or the second urbanization of India. So this is in brief the story that we can tell. Thank you very much for your... Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would now request uh, Chormishta. Shomishta, uh, I am uh, just introduce introduce uh, now the um, uh, speaker uh, Michel Danino. Uh, French-born Michel Danino has lived uh, in India since 1977 and has been an Indian citizen since uh, 2004. A student of Indian civilization. He has written a uh, proto-historical India, The Lost River on the Trail of the Saraswati, 2010, and Indian Culture, Indian Culture and India's Future in 2011, Sri Aurobindo and India's Rebirth, an edited volume in 2018. He has lectured and taught at several educational institutions. Since 2011, he has been teaching courses on Indian civilization and knowledge systems at IIT Gandhinagar, where he is currently visiting professor and assists its archaeological sciences center. He is also convener of a CBST community committee uh, for the course of knowledge, traditions and practices of India, whose two volume textbook he co-edited with Professor Kapil Kapoor, 2013 and 2015. Michel Danino is a member of several scholarly and government bodies including the Central Advisory Board on Culture, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, the National uh, Steering Committee for the Development of National Curriculum, Frameworks and Auroville's International Advisory Council. In 2017, the government of India awarded him Padma Sri by uh, Padma Sri for his work on education and culture. It is the uh, brief profile of our lecture. Uh, one, uh, someone has put a question, I don't know, to Basu. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I am there. Can I ask a question to Michelle, sir? Yes, sir. Of course. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, sir, uh, we can see in the um, later um, excavations, like uh, in Harappan civilization, which is uh, earlier called, we can see it has li some importance to the uh, in the al Alamgirpur near the Uttar Pradesh, there is the Harappan site. So, does it 
proclaim that uh, in Rig Veda we can see there is mention of Ganga is one time and therefore we can see that uh, in, uh, in the Saraswati in the space relation we can find only one side that is Alamgirpur uh, one side therefore can we have a linkage in there uh, so briefly, uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, there are there are more sites, at least five or six sites um, east of Yamuna. But um, as far as I know, there are no sites, no Harappan sites east of Ganga. The Harappans do not appear to have crossed Ganga. If some traders explored, we don't know for sure. There is some very, very limited evidence, which uh, is not very conclusive. But uh, as far as I understand, you know, the, the heartland of, of the Harappan civilization was really uh, the northwest of the subcontinent, including parts of Afghanistan um, and almost all the way to the uh, Iranian border. So, uh, you know, they had to, and, and in the south, it was almost to the Tapti and, and Narmada rivers. They had to stop somewhere. They could not, uh, you know, and I think the Harappans, we have to consider that when they reach an urban stage of development, they are more interested in trading or exploring or settling in regions that can either provide them trade opportunities or raw materials. These are for them, I think, the main two motivations. And uh, therefore, perhaps east of Ganga, there was nothing. Perhaps this was still, you know, uh, Neolithic settlements, uh, developed agricultural settlements. But there was there was perhaps nothing of great interest to them. So by and large, if you look at the geography of the Rig Veda to come to your question, it is Sapta Sindhava. There is no doubt about it. It includes the Afghan tributaries of Sindhu, the Indus. And this is more or less precisely the territory of the Harappan civilization. The late Professor Bibilal uh, heavily insisted on this point that the two geographies quite uh, quite well coincide. So, so this is one possible argument in favor of a connection between the two. Of course, it is not sufficient. It is not clinching. We have to look at many, many other aspects, uh, including all the cultural features that archaeology uh, gives us, for the, but also the, the problem that the script is not uh, you know, conclusively deciphered. So if the script is deciphered one day, of course, it will help a lot in resolving the question of putting in parallel Harappan and Vedic uh, cultures, uh, because if the language is Indo-European, -Euro Indo Indo-Aryan, Sanskritic, to, to be simple, uh, then of course it will be a major uh, evidence in, in favor of a parallel. But if it turns out to be something different, then we will have to consider. So this is as briefly as I can put it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Ranjuna Rai, uh, can I just uh, just uh, uh, congratulate uh, all of you, uh, speaker? I am uh, Shopna Bhattacharya, and uh, just uh, to congratulate uh, Kolkata Society and also uh, Professor Roy and other speakers. And uh, uh, just uh, at one point, I was thinking when you are talking about urbanization, I was just thinking about the Pura and Southeast Asia the you know Dharavati, the uh, downfall of Dharavati. and another question also i had i would have asked uh, about uh, adi Banerjee, his team i will send my question because uh, i knew a um, archaeologist from shantiniketan horidash mitra maybe you know his name so i was interested in, uh, and about ng mojumdar whether he is the ng mojumdar perhaps durga basu my uh, friend can tell me uh, inscription of bengal is it the same uh, and professor a ghosh i i think he came to shantiniketan so i i met many of them uh, but uh, just not to uh, and and then also a uh, very respected uh, professor pallok Gupta when he talked about heinz mode and uh, his linguistic uh, contribution i was thinking about the burushaski language which uh, Professor Hermann Berger from Heidelberg University explored and uh, during his three years uh, visit to Pakistan. So all this uh, linguistic world uh, should be taken up. Thank you very much and uh, all of you. And, uh, and also- Thank you, Shabna. Thank you very much. 
and you have also very very patiently and passionately chaired the session all the things oh, thank you so much i am not very efficient i know i know that uh, now show me your job what are you doing yes uh, and now i uh, invite professor durga basu to propose the vote of thanks thank you shomishta mm. mm, good evening everybody mm, we have just heard some of the most interesting lectures during this period so it is so mesmerizing to hear some subjects regarding or some aspects regarding harappan civilization from the stalwarts from the archaeologists who have dedicated their entire lives in the search of the early civilization especially the harappan civilization so really really uh, it is very very illuminating lectures we have heard from uh, these four speakers so at the very onset i would like to thank all the distinguished speakers who have delivered some of the very interesting aspects of urban civilization we are really illuminated we have come to know so many new things some of the discoveries new discoveries from these scholars so it is indeed a pleasure to have with us today dr mani dear mani dr sindhe and uh, dr monjul and dr denino michel uh, with us and uh, what is interesting to find out that each and every speaker has pointed out some of the very relevant aspect of harappan civilization now it is very interesting to find that uh, dr mani when he mentioned that some of the sanskrit words uh, have been uh, found in the sumerian text uh, and especially in the musical aspect so it is very informative for us another thing is that dr manjul has already uh, showed us some of the excavations the on rakhigadi as you all know the rakhigadi is a famous harappan site and it's a very large site so it is also very interesting to see all these aspects all the artifacts uh, discovered from that particular site another thing is uh, that um, dr sindhe what a mesmerizing lecture he has showed us he has given us a panoramic view of the inter, the of the last 100 years the research works the some of the pioneering research works of the scholars so we are also very very thankful to dr sindhe and also dr danny neo no it is our heartfelt thank to dr daninio because he has raised some very very pertinent issues or questions regarding harappan civilization uh, which are yet to solved so again i record my deep sense of gratitude to all these scholars and uh, definitely we we will we would expect that we will again meet them and we should have uh, some of the interactions with these scholars i also express my heartfelt thanks to professor pallav shen gupta and professor ranjana rai who always have been playing the role of mentors i am also thankful to all the participants scholars and friends for their presence and participation in this seminar thank you all thank you and good night uh, i think they have uh, someone wanted the feedback link that is put up in the chat box the link if anyone wants the feedback link that is given in the chat box thank you thank you all thank you thank you all